anything goes in our world, you know. Mm. I mean, it's 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 not crippled by Phoenix, but it's the same people, it's the same world, you know. And it's like, well, I mean, why not? You know, it's not even a crippled by Phoenix song. It's a Johnny the Boy song, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's on a crippled by Phoenix album, and if but it messes with people's heads. They don't, you know, doing things like that. It, that people don't really. They don't really get it, I guess. I guess. Greetings, friends. Welcome to episode 183 of Into the Necrosphere. On this installment of the podcast, my guests are Justin Greaves and Belinda Cordick of Johnny the Boy and Crippled Black Phoenix, a episode I have wanted to do for some time now, uh, and the timing could not be better because, as you know, the new Johnny the Boy record is an absolute banger. We spoke about the album, we spoke about Crippled Black Phoenix, we spoke about Gravity Biking, we spoke about Cats, and we found some common ground on social issues so a genuinely enjoyable insightful uh, and I would say very soulful conversation so that is going to be coming your way very shortly but first Putrescension is a band out of New Jersey who feature Justin Spath of Tombs on drums uh, and Michael Goncalves on vocals. Uh, he, of course, is a member of uh, Scorpion Throne, uh, who also features one of my fellow horsemen of the podcasting apocalypse, Mike Hill. Uh, Putrescension have got two EPs out, Hate Lust and The Obsidian Fog. Uh, disgracefully they are not yet signed and so therefore I present them to you right now the legions by way of their brand new single the ancient spirit
You just listened to The Ancient Spirit by Pewter Ascension out of New Jersey. They feature members of Tombs and Scorpion Throne. They are disgracefully unsigned at the moment. Hopefully that changes at some point in the very near future. And when it does, you can let them know that you heard them first on Into the Necrosphere. Make sure you check out their Bandcamp link. I'll post that in the description to the podcast. And if you buy yourself some music, of course, let them know who sent you. My friends, if you're new to the podcast, please elbow drop the subscribe button on your platform of choice if you've not already done so uh leave me a five star review because that really helps hijack the algorithm uh make sure that you head over to the into the necrosphere teespring store and pick yourself out a t-shirt or a hoodie uh and follow me on the socials and then very very critically i am part of a shadowy organization some would say a gang of fellow podcasters who every single week bring you high quality content uh, that covers horror, metal, and really anything else that comes to mind. It starts on Monday with Brandon Legion bringing you Horror Wolf 666. Uh, on a Tuesday, there's yours truly casting hexes and slaying poses on Into the Necrosphere. Every Wednesday, Sensei Mike Hill brings you his long running podcast, Everything Went Black, a smorgasbord of guests that include everybody from MMA fighters through to musicians through to artists uh anything and everything goes on that podcast he returns on a thursday uh, alongside his co-hosts sheriff mike scondado and the professor jeff kashid with my favorite podcast of the week necromaniacs they review old and new horror movies they recently did a fantastic episode on the 1974 classic burnt offerings make sure you check that out and then finally make sure you tune in every sunday if you are interested in the esoteric the occult and the arcane because the reverend Carl Hikara takes you on a journey into darkness on his weekly podcast Solnox. Also stick around after my conversation with Belinda and Justin because I'm going to be doing a roundup of some of my favorite releases of the week uh, and uh, I have heard rumors that there's a new Cannibal Corp single out and of course there's only one place where that single can truly have its metal tested and that is on my weekly news rant so stick around for that enjoy the show sit back as i welcome to the podcast the members of johnny the boy and crippled black phoenix i was going to say justin uh you probably don't realize how big of a cult following our problem had in in South Africa. <laughs> that's like where you where i was first introduced to your music but like i iron monkey and particularly the our problem uh, record was fucking like in, in all my circles like all in, in, in like the you know the the, the underground low lifes it was a huge huge record yeah. um so uh yeah you can uh you can you can put that additional feather in your cap and say i had a cult following in south africa <laughs> that, that additional sh shit in me pants <laughs> yeah but yeah man, what a what a uh, record I, I, I still go back to it from time to time oh, um it's, uh, it's a bit bit weird for that you know to, to hear that about because everybody says they were around at the time and that the nobody ever was so <laughs> no mate no i i it was a it was an incredible record and i it's it's weird to me nowadays like i'll hear bands do certain things i'm like there's no way you didn't listen to iron monkey to to get that idea um like i think the i think the influence of that band and again for me especially that record i think is very understated oh well nice of you to say so but uh, before we talk about music any any further i i i said to you when we when we were all fair like you know i don't sit here with a, a list of questions i want to talk about but i do do a little bit of investigation just to see you know what the person i'm talking to is into and i i saw your post about um the gravity biking and i it, i'm a total layman to it don't know anything about it really I, I saw the speeds that you go uh, when you, you know, when you're, when you're doing it and, you know, you talk about like a shit your pants moment, like <laughs> so for anybody that doesn't know, you, you can answer this question. How, like when, when you're, you know, when you're in a race, what, what sort of speeds would you typically reach on your, on your bike? Uh, it depends if we're doing, cause sometimes we do time trial and sometimes we do head to head. So like when we're racing together on the track, <clears throat> four or five six bikes up obviously the speeds are lower but it's you know you, you're battling against each other so in the uk you know with the roads and the and the, everything um i mean anywhere between you know 40 and 65 miles an hour you know mm. so it's like we can we can reach 100 kilometers an hour on a on a road quite easily um 
you know, when you're bigger, low, you know, fast roads where you're doing time trials and that, it can be a bit faster. You know, the, the, the actual speed records is up there, like 90 miles an hour or something. Yeah, we, uh, again, which is absolutely insane. You know, you're on a if you if you're on a, a skateboard going twenty miles an hour, that's that's mm -hmm. seriously fast. Like, I don't think that people I, necessarily realize how ridiculous it would be to go sixty miles an hour on a bike. And I mean, these these bikes mm -hmm. are, are are custom built for, um, you know, for the for going at a particular speed, right? And for for this for the style of riding that you're doing when you're racing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All, all, all custom built. So, but. You'd mentioned skateboards. A friend of mine, Pete Connolly, who comes and races with us because sometimes we, we race with the uh, with the longboards and and the street luges. So Pete Connolly, he set the world record on a stand up skateboard, and he did ninety one miles an hour, one hundred and forty odd kilometers an hour, <laughs> stood up on a skateboard. Crazy, dude. So, that's fucking yeah. Nuts. There you go. But, you know, <laughs> to there's, say there's, that's there's, that's there's, definitely there's, 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 it's that's not that's not in me to even even dream of doing. But so you are doing something pretty extraordinary with the gravity biking because you're going to be participating in the in the world championships in Italy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, next next month, like the sixteenth, is the finals. So mm. yeah, sixteenth next month. Yeah, world record. Uh, so world. what what kind of um, uh, what what's kind of the qualification process for you to be able to get there? uh you it's kind of like it's not particularly an invite thing but there's like a limited amount of spaces so like you've kind of got to be in it to 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 get to get there kind of thing um but uh i mean anyone can do it but uh i wouldn't say anyone can just jump in and do world champs or at least be competitive you know mm. but uh this is probably kind of i mean i'm i'm getting on a bit so i'm not getting any faster so this is a bit of a bucket list thing for me. So, yeah, that's why I've been pushing it, you know. So, you know, I always say, you know, I, I feel a bit guilty using the, the bands kind of, you know, I'm not very good at social media or anything, but I kind of use it to get to get it out there. If there's like a cause or something, I'm trying to raise awareness or I'm trying to like get, you know, maybe get a bit of sponsorship because, you know, you know what it's like in England right now. It's, mm. it's really bad for people like us. So, yeah, yeah. But anyway, uh, fingers crossed. Yeah. How how did you initially get into the racket? How did you develop an interest in the in the sport? Um, I started racing BMX in the eighties, nineteen eighty two. I started racing. Mm. There you go. Shows my age. <laughs> well, I was about to ask you. So, how old are you now? Doing the doing the world championships? I'm fifty one. Wowzers. Okay. And what is what is the average age of people that would be doing the championships now? <laughs> Probably in the twenties. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, well, dude, I, I I will definitely share because I know you've got a a, a a like a sponsorship fundraiser page. I'll definitely share that hey, uh, when when this uh, episode goes out as well. Thank you, thank you. You know, uh, with, you know, we talk about music, so I mean, thanks for mentioning that and thanks for sharing that because it's very close to. Me. To my heart anyway so. yeah no definitely mate and i i mean i i'm i'm just blown away that you do i mean whether you were 51 or 21 i'm blown <laughs> away that you're doing it so um, uh, you know i can i can still beat the guys that are like younger than my own daughter you know so <laughs> yeah yeah there you go well like i said awesome awesome uh but i mean awesome achievement and, and I'll, I'll be rooting for you when the time comes and as i said probably be very glad that i'm not in on the on the bike myself <laughs> so <laughs> but but let's talk a bit about um about you about johnny the boy because man this this record really kind of caught me by like as a real side swipe i i'm a fan of Cripple black phoenix very much so especially the last couple of records and i i hadn't partly because you know i'm also older you know i've got a job so a lot of a lot of news kind of skates by me so i get this email from season of mist and it's like new johnny the boy record and i'm like johnny the boy is that like an emo band what the fuck's going on yeah <laughs> and i i i go i go and i see okay cripple black phoenix i was like okay let me let me give this a listen and I was I was halfway through that first song, and I was like, "Holy Jesus!" And and Belinda, I don't know whether you saw my review, but I I said you sound like Jeff Walker if he was possessed by the devil. <laughs> so, <laughs> like, it is. I mean, like your your vocal performance, I will tell you now, is one of the best 
best extreme metal vocal performances I've heard all year. It is absolutely fucking sensational. I agree. But but where did the where did the idea for this come from? It was never it was never an idea. It just came. I guess I got a lot of pent up shit going on, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's what it is. It just it naturally came. First time we rehearsed with my old grunge band. I mean, it was really the, I mean the this how do you say acoustics, acoustics was mm -hmm. really loud and it was a mix of overpowering it and no it just I don't I don't think I just do mm -hmm. you know, when you sing you shouldn't think about how it's gonna sound why do you do that yeah yeah but I mean the, the the idea for the actual band obviously the, the the legend as I had read it was that <laughs> you guys did the hidden track on the last scribbleback Phoenix record. And then the folks at Season of Mist heard it, and they they were so impressed by that they wanted a whole a whole album's worth. And is that is that is that true? Is that how it how it kind of came into being, or how this record came into being? That's the, that's, <clears throat> that's a simple version, I think. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I suppose if you want to go into the the um, you know the whole backstory, you know the origins. Um, me and Belinda, obviously, with our history, we, we've, we've been doing stuff that's, like, not particularly heavy, if you see what I mean. It's yeah. not like yeah, yeah. We, both of us, like, Belinda retired from her kind of music scene. I retired from my music scene when I left Electric Wizard and things like that. Um, and we kind of had enough of it, a bit disillusioned. But we still, we grew up in, you know, more extreme heavy kind of forms of music and everything. So we still love it, you know. Uh, and of course, uh, when we're doing Cripple Black Phoenix, we we're, were rehearsing, I think it was around about 2017, something like that. We are rehearsing down on uh, Arthur's farm, and uh, we were just having, you know, a break or whatever. Somebody was, it wasn't Ben, somebody else jumped on the drums and was just prattling about, you know. So then I was playing some kind of primitive black metal riff. Belinda sat there, and she starts doing the she starts doing her <laughs> punchy stuff. And then so uh, one of the guys was filming it. And it ended up, we just put it as a joke online, you know, hey, this is the new Cooperbot Phoenix kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. And um, people were like, seriously? Is this like legit? And we're just like, ah, ah, ah. Um, well, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> um, so it's been bubbling along since then. So mm. it's been quite a few years and we've been talking about it. And then we did like some demo songs and we did it under a different name. We did, we were originally going to call it World War because mm. we wanted to be kind of, you know, all like just super nihilistic. N mm. Nothing mm. new, no clever titles, no clever name or anything. We just wanted to be like, yeah, World War, pff, annihilate everything. And that got old really quickly. Um, but we did the demo, we did it with Matt. So he has a little. Yeah, Matt wanted to be here, but he's camping, and he's really bad reception. So yeah, no, yeah. that's that, that's fine. That's absolutely fine. Um, so he, yeah, so he recorded that. So we did have some demo songs, one of which was No Regrets, and then yeah, we we re-recorded that just as a just as something cheeky on the end of the Cripple Bite Phoenix album. It was like, mm. you know, it, I don't know. I mean, it's like for for us, it's anything goes in our world. You know, mm. I mean, it's it's. It's not crippled by Phoenix, but it's the same people. It's the same world, you know. And it's like, well, I mean, why not? You know, it's not even a crippled by Phoenix song. It's a Johnny the Boy song, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's on a crippled by Phoenix album, and it, but it messes with people's heads. They don't, you know, doing things like that. It, that people don't really, they don't really get it. I get, I guess. Uh, uh, but well, I was going to ask you, like, like, how does the no, Cribble Black, or how, how would the Cribble Black Phoenix, I guess the typical Cribble Black Phoenix fan, I was going to ask you about the typical, the typical Cribble Black Phoenix fan, but then I thought to myself, well, I, I'm a fan of the band, and I love it, and I mean, I, I mean, I come from more of a black metal and, and, and heavy kind of t taste spectrum myself, so I would imagine there isn't really something that you would call a typical fan of your band, because I think you guys make such an eclectic style of music, and it's so creatively free, it, it it would come as a surprise, perhaps. But then I think when people take a step back and they sort of reflect on it, they go, "Well, why am I surprised?" A, both of your backgrounds are from heavy music. B, you know, it it, 
it it's it doesn't sound entirely out of 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 kilter for you guys if you know what i mean but maybe i'm thinking that the early days of crippled where we you did have a kind of audience and that was the middle-aged german belly potted losing your head type of man. no no that could be very nice that to you that was a certain kind of audience that you did mm. but then then the, after that every album was like different 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 it was i think we've we gone more more away from prog and more into other worlds so i think that kind of audience is more open for this hmm. that's what i think yeah <clears throat> i think we 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 sort of fell into that world a bit too much which was i think it because it, it wasn't by design you know it was it was a complete it was a bit of a mistake really but i don't want to put anything down or anybody down at the time but I, I think we just, I belly potted men with I think I think we uh, yeah, no. but that's but no but you're right though there was no, a demographic uh, when when no. Belinda joined the band in like 2012 or whatever it was there was a demographic that was like oh, you've uh, you you paused there for a second uh, but oh, you you, okay. you were talking about a specific demographic yeah yeah so that when Belinda joined you know, uh, twin, 2012, did you get a bit? Anyway. Yeah. Um, we'd already gone from being like the so-called Portishead Mogwai Electric Wizard Supergroup, right? But that was only because of Jeff and Dominic's involvement, mm. because they were my friends. Nothing more than that. Um, so we'd gone from that. So we were being courted by the indie press and, the, the you know, all that kind of stuff, the NME and all that. And then they discovered we weren't, like those guys mm. so then we got dumped by those and then the prog guys they got really into it because of the pink floyd kind of influence and those guys are very open-minded and at one point we did have a, a whole load of fans that were mostly german and they were mostly middle-aged guys with pink floyd shirts on um which yeah. is nothing wrong with that we love them the bits and we still we still see them you know because they're great fans you know great supporters of the band mm. but yeah we did we did at that point we did get dragged into the whole prog world and there were certain forces around the band at that time that kind of maybe took it a little bit a step too far into that world and the thing is though we've never been a prog band yeah so there was a little bit of a knee-jerk reaction to that but since then i think we like belinda says I think things have calmed down and we just know ourselves and we just do what we like now. You know, we, there's, we don't, honestly, we don't think about what we do. We just do it. Mm. Which is, again, which is interesting because they, it feels as somebody who, I mean, I knew the band, you know, in the, in the, um, you know, in the demographic days. Yeah. And I, and I, I, I have enjoyed the more recent records that Crippled Black Phoenix has put out much more because I think because of that sense of creative freedom, but there's also definitely a sense of, I feel like there's more chemistry in the band on these newer records than than you could hear on the on the other records. There's kind of a, yeah. it's going to sound very um, very esoteric saying this. Is, there's a joy when you hear those records <laughs> to, that you're getting from the people making the music. It's, it's people that are genuinely liking what they're doing. You two clearly have creatively an, an exceptional chemistry together. How did the two of you meet? <laughs> Justin. Uh, are you, am I telling this story? Yeah. <laughs> so uh i was right in crafty eight um and there was a couple of songs i really wanted some female vocals i didn't want the because we've had we had a little smidgen of female vocals and it, it usually it was either um the old pianist or, or chipper mm. who used to play cello they would do some anyway i didn't want those voices i just wanted something different same time as that, uh, I was passed on Belinda's solo album, you know, The Killing Mood. <laughs> no, I've never heard it. <laughs> Killing Mood. Anyone? Right. I, I was about to say, I, I, I don't know it. I'm definitely going to have to check it out. Um, yeah, so so yeah, Killing, Killing Mood is the record. Killing yeah. Mood with a D. I'm Killing well, Mood. Like, okay. That, yeah. can't, not, what would you say? That, that's, that's totally solo album. Totally. I play. Right. And... Amazing. It's an amazing album. Oh, no. Don't listen. Don't listen to Belinda. She, no, it's over, over. No, it was. It's, it's, it's a really beautiful album. Anyway, and her voice is like, for me, it's just so perfect. 
and it and it's really different mm. and it the voice isn't like i don't like kind of you know the people who put on a voice and yeah. to me it just sounds like belinda's kind of just naturally weird sounding you know <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, well, it, it's more soulful because, like, like I, I find, you know, in in this day and age where you know so many, um, so many of the, so many of the high profile, you know, mainstream singers, that what you just meant, what you just said now about putting on a voice, it sounds so acted and it sounds so superficial, and you know, I, I, I feel like in some ways it's sad because it, it, it oftentimes drowns out some of the some of the more authentic some of the truly soulful voices that that I really do think you connect with more you know if i think of if i think of some of my favorite you know women singing um pj harvey definitely you know that's somebody who you know absolutely can make the hair stand up on the back of your neck just with a just with an inflection of the way that she sings but it's because there's something that's so honest that comes comes out of the way that she sings and and so belinda when i when i hear your clean vocals i've often thought of pj harvey i've thought of chelsea wolf it's like but there's there's a there's a real kind of unique personality in the way that you sing as well, uh, and the interesting thing is how you're able to translate that personality into doing extreme vocals too. Because in stream, you know, extreme vocals by design are meant to be inhuman, but there's a very human touch to what you're doing, which almost in a way makes it more aggressive and more convincing. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, I don't want to I don't want to sound like I'm blowing smoke up your ass here, but <laughs> as you as you can tell, I was very Good very luck, impressed with it. So. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I kind of I think what I do do apparently that's maybe apparently different to like normal metal scenes, whatever is that while I do the necro, I'm also singing. Mm. You know what I mean? So like in in um, without you in the in the verses it's like two vocals at the same time i have the mm. light one behind there but i'm doing that but you know it's just anyway that's how i roll yeah. did you uh, ever did you ever take any lessons or anything like that is there any kind of formal training in your singing no i no. i sang like this but it was it was even more golem by then i, I now i i, I and another little bit of another technique but no this was the first i sang like this before i ever took the normal tone mm. so yeah so i was more nervous singing with crippled because i, I had to find my natural voice and that was really that, that was really nerve-wracking for me well <laughs> funny funny you mentioned you know, that i i i spoke to aaron of my dying bride like a probably about 100 episodes ago and and he told me a story about when he started doing clean vocals for the first time in the band he said he felt so self-conscious that yes. they would be in the band room literally and he would turn around and put his, his shirt over his head no. because it, it's it's like <laughs> such a it's like he said it's such a nerve-wracking thing yeah. having to sing in a way that's that's so honest it's like he said it, it it feels like you're bearing your soul whereas with a you know with a growl or a scream it it, it it's quite different because like i said by design it's meant to be in human it's meant to be a certain way with this with singing it's, there's almost no place to hide i know yeah true but the funny thing is this way that i sing on on what's the band jonathan boy is actually <laughs> this is going to sound weird but that is the real me in a mm. way because that that's a lot of it's like this okay let's get deep here yo I am not a crier. I never cry. I only cry if it's animals. But mm. so there's loads of shit that if you if I talk to psychologists, they tell me. I think that's why it comes out this way. It's like I don't cry, so it has to come out that way. Only for animals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I must say I, I've become pretty sentimental in my old age. I. I <laughs> you do. Yeah. I, uh, I, well, I mean, animals I've always been sentimental over, but you know, th things like if, um, I mean, I remember the day my daughter was born. I mean, that was fucking water, waterwork city. <laughs> I don't think I've ever cried so much in my entire life. But. You get really, because I'm 51 too. I'm like Justin, and I, I, I am, you do get more sentimental. You do, you really do. I have to change as soon as there's a scene on a film or something. It's like, oh no, I, I don't want to watch it. It's, you know, I just have to turn turn the channel because I don't I don't need to see it. I think for me, I mean, w where I think some of that comes from as well is it's a it's an appreciation of of you know whether it's people or whether it's a moment that you're able to experience or even sometimes it'll be like 
you know, you'll hear, you'll hear a song and the song will be so good or the setting that you're hearing it in is so good. You, you almost kind of feel grateful. You've had the opportunity to do that. Mm -hmm. I think actually in some ways, you know, everything that happened during COVID snapped a lot of that into focus as well. It's like, you know, the, any, any, anything can happen that, that changes your ability to be able to enjoy life in the way that you used to enjoying it. Uh, and also when you get older, you know, people that, you know, start passing away. And then again, that reminds you of your own mortality. And so again, you start to, cherish those moments those you know the, you know the animals i mean like, like again now with with my dog as an example anytime i sit next to her she's 12 years old now i know you know yeah. statistically it's two maybe three years at, at most well, until i can find some crazy longevity treatment that she can that really? she can do but I, I i really do um remind myself it's like look i you know you are only going to get to do this so many more times. So whether she stomps your groin when she jumps on the bed in the morning, and you know that sucks, and you your in, your 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 reflexes to get annoyed about it don't, because yeah. you're going to get to a place in in, in the not too distant future where you're going to wish that that could still yeah. be happening. Mm. But that's a good thing because you know how a lot of people like oh I have this near death experience. It's only then they appreciate the small things. But you want to get to that without having a near death experience. And I mean yeah. you're not old yet how old are you 43 oh you're young anyway so it's good that <laughs> it's good that you are there already now mm. you know what i mean mm. not a lot of not a lot of people are yeah no i i i think well i think th th i think there's it, it, it's all the things that I mentioned now that kind of drives that, but it's also, you know, respecting your place in the world and understanding that, you know, you're, uh, you're here for a, you know, Very absolute minuscule millisecond in the grand scheme of things. Yeah. And in, again, in the grand scheme of things, maybe you've got kids or maybe something, you know, maybe you've got a little bit of a legacy or leave behind, but, you know, for the most part, you, you, you know, people's people's and, and the generation's memory is short, you know, you don't mean that much. So you kind of, I, I call it being, you know, you sort of need to humble yourself before the universe a little bit and appreciate the things you have rather than demanding what the, you know, what can the universe give me today? Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. at that time, Justin, that was actually, you know, like from the song, everything is beautiful but us. And that was a lockdown COVID. And even though COVID was a horrible thing and, and erased the population from our planet, that was the best time for us mm. with the wildlife. Yeah. When it, when you took when you took the humans out of the equation, oh, everything be, yeah, everything became yeah. nice again. <laughs> I mean, bumblebees this big, you know, and mm. like, you know, it's yeah. like yeah, I mean, time, that was the best time. That's the best time I've had for a long time. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. I mean, this is when, like, you know, if people think we're some kind of like hippy drippies or something. It's like, no, I vote for a human call. I don't think we can be clustered <laughs> as, as hippies, you know, but um. No, I mean, it's, it's it's really simple, you know. It's all about just not being a dick, you know. Mm. You have to treat people with respect. There's what you, you know, the sort of respect you expect back, you know. And and when people don't treat you with respect, then that's it. You know, glove, gloves are off at that point. But mm. that, that's an with idea. Doesn't it give you, how, how old's your child, if I may ask? Oh, yeah, of course. Uh, she's just turned nine. Yeah, how how are you feeling like the planet and the world of you? And you don't you have a little bit of anxiety for, for her? <laughs> Um, I do, but I'm very, I've always been a big believer in, you know, control the controllable. I think a lot of stress and anxiety is, is rooted in, in us trying to control things that we have no hope of controlling. So as I, as I see it, you know, I, I have an, I have the ability to, to try and be a positive influence in her life. Because again, if she's, she's anything like her dad, she's, she's too stubborn to, uh, be, be taught anything anyway she's going to figure stuff out for herself but i can be a positive influence in her life and i think you also need to understand you know at least my experience with with raising her is it's it you can't try and sprint up the mountain you know you need to take it one step at a time maybe like this week recently you know she she didn't want to go to do the you know her school sports day and i said to her you know why not you know it's like i don't want to it's like like, well, look, there's a lot of things in life that you're not going to want to do. And, you know, sometimes you just have to buckle down and do it. And, you know, your friends are going to be there. You might have a great time. And so she did it. Yesterday, she called me all excited. I did it. And, you know, I got this prize and I got this prize. So you kind of need to take the small things um, as, a, as, a, as a win. Um, but, no, I, 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 have, I have anxiety about the world she might go into. And I wish there's things that I could 
protect her from, mm -hmm. you know, uh, but at the same time, I, I, I can, the only thing I can do as a, as a, as a parent is to try and, and do the best I possibly can to prepare her to be a decent adult. Yeah. Um, and beyond that, I mean, there's, 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 there's nothing else I can, I can do. It's not in your, on, in your control. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. No. Uncontrollable. Can you? Well, exactly, and, and again, I think I think society okay. a, a, a lot a lot of <laughs> a lot of what what you see people stress out about massively is it's it's things like they they cannot possibly control. No, so, mind yeah. wasting, right? Mental it it, it right? is. Mental it's it's a lot of in, it's a lot of energy invested into something you, you you will never see a return in that on that energy that you're investing. You uh, uh, you're, all yeah. you'll see is you know alcohol dependency, sleepless nights, and you know <laughs> early coronary onset heart disease yeah i mean they talk, talk about energy i mean there's you go down that route there's a lot of negative energies there's so much negative energies that's you know that's the sort of maybe the, the downside of sort of this modern technology age with the you know social media and everything you know so much negative energy and we're better than that you know? mm. Well, I think with, I think social media has become an amplification device for negative energy. I think that's the problem. You know, the I, I I'm a big believer in that people respond to incentives, whatever the incentive structure is there, right? And people hear the word incentive and they think of money. It's not it's not money. It's it's reward. So, what's the reward mechanism in social media? The reward mechanism is is validation and likes. So, people yeah. will post whatever crazy nonsense comes into their mind. Um, because what, whatever fringe lunatic garbage is the is the flavor of the day seems to get attract the most attention. They attract attention, and they get they, they they get the likes, and then they do it again. And other people see that people benefit from this, so they do the same thing. And I think I think if there's anything that's 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 missing from the world right now, if I like if I could you know wave a magic wand and and say you know what are the two three things that schools for example should be doing to you know to um, try and turn things around from 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 where we're headed. I mean, one is 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 revisiting what kids are being taught at school and actually teaching them proper skills. You know, a lot a lot of the, a lot of the the problem that kids get them or that adults get themselves into is as a result of ignorance. And it's almost you think about it, it it's it's willful ignorance on the part of the schools. And and I, I don't believe in a grand conspiracy whereby that ignorance is by design. But you know, I can sort of certainly entertain that notion. You know, the fact that most kids don't know anything about personal finance and by the time they're in their mid-20s they're already vast deeply in debt and then they can't figure out why you know uh, things are uh, why, why the debt accumulates and gets gets worse so are you gonna say i mean i just because the uh, there's a bit of a delay i think going on there um yeah i mean the problem is you know the ed education system it's not really set up for for the betterment of the children it, it's no the education system in in the uk has been set up hundreds of years ago as a way of subjugation mm. you know it's a way of like that's why there's that's why there's a class divide that's why there's public schools and private schools you know that wouldn't exist if it was if it was a proper education system mm. you know there's huge big divide between you know the ruling class who are going to educate their children a certain way and have certain skills and like you know the rest of them can go fuck themselves basically mm. you know it's it's a real it's a really really bad way so like yeah i mean you're talking about the you know, education it's like the the most important thing you know giving kids skills it's like let kids be kids for a start yeah. and then there's a really kind of very simple fundamentals but they don't they're, they're not, you know they've not invested in art or culture or, or, or say for instance music right we're musicians you know like, talk about the music that's a really really good skill to have because it makes you think of i mean it involves mathematics it involves psych psychology and you know it's philosophy even mm -hmm. you know it makes you think it makes you feel it gives you skills it gives you mechanical skills motor skills you know your brain and everything you know it's a really really good tool to have but they just, well, I, I think you actually just touched on one of the biggest benefits that it provides, and that is that there's a there's a cognitive benefit to it, right? And it's a yeah. it's a positive outlet, regardless of the genre of music that you play or you're interested in. It's a it's a positive outlet. And I feel like in the UK, 
there's definitely a, a cutting off of as many positive outlets as as possible for the for the youth, and then they wonder why they have youth that act out. This was this was one of the biggest surprises when I first moved to the UK too. You you mentioned the the class divide. You know, you have a you have a view of the country before you before you move here. And I think the class divide was one of the one of the biggest shocks to me. It's like Jesus Christ! Like it, it's it literally is like you're living in two, three different countries. People yeah. speak a different language. They operate a different way. They almost have their own distinct culture. It's it's nuts. Yeah. I, I I I never realized how deep that divide went and how extreme it is. And actually, interestingly too, how disdainful both you know the different sides are of each other. And I would argue from my own personal experience. Particularly, you know, the 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 kind of old money, rich rich types, the view they have of anybody that they deem to be below them is you, is absolutely uh, horrifying. You know what? The more more the, the more the point is that the the upper class are, are the ones on the sort of the off offensive. If you see what I mean. So the the old money. And the old ruling class are also the people who had the like the old empire, mm -hmm. and they subjugated not just people in the UK but people around the world, you know, with the old empire and everything. So, people's disdain towards the upper class is a reaction. You know, it's a reaction to the way they've been treated. Mm. It's like, say, for instance, animal rights. We're involved in animal rights. That's a reaction. That's a reaction against people mistreating animals and we don't like bullies you know me and belinda are very similar like that we we hate bullies and that's why we we you know we're more kind of and say that people have a problem with like if you say you're anti-fascist let's say they think oh no you know far left troublemaker it's like no it don't work like that there wouldn't be anti-fascist if there wasn't fasc fascist that's the offensive that's the subjugation going on right there Mm. Everything else is a reaction. So it's like the mod modern thing on social media, you know, the whole the gaslight and everything. It's like, well, we're gonna we're gonna call this guy out for being different. We're gonna abuse this guy for being different. Whatever it could be that he's a different race, different gender, whatever. We're gonna call them out for being different. Somebody then speaks up against that. You can't tell us what to do. That's censorship. It's like mm -hmm. no. No, you don't work like that. You can't call somebody telling you to stop abusing somebody else, a fascist, for trying to stop stop you from abusing someone else. That's, yeah, you can't. You can't. It doesn't. Uh, work. It's like that. You know, for every action, there's there's a there's a response, uh, yeah. or certainly for every action, there's consequences. You can't. You can't claim. You you know. You can't claim censorship when you say something that you know you know genuinely causes offence. Yeah. Um. And there's there's a response to it. And they, you know, and now, now suddenly you're 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 on the defensive. Now I, I agree with you on that. But what? Um, think, what as an outside about you know, I've been in England quite a bit. What's kind of shocking to me most is how UK is turning into a dictatorship. Yeah. You know, you can't, what's it called when you you can't? What's it called out on the street and woohoo? Yeah, I mean, on protest. You probably what the fuck. Yeah. Exactly. Well, so it's so interesting about that, right? Th there have been laws passed almost in concert across multiple countries. It, it, it started in, I think it was December of last year, December of no, uh, uh, November. Germany passed an anti rioting law. Um, UK passed one. There's a number of, of countries across Europe that, that all passed them around about the same time. And at the time, I was, I was watching it and I was thinking to myself, I wonder whether they're not nervous about what could potentially happen with the cost of living increases, the fact that you know uh, the price of uh, electricity, the price of power is going to go up exponentially, inflation is going to go up exponentially, and if in the UK as an example they continue to to you know turn the handle on interest rates, I think we're probably one two interest rates away from having a a very very titanic um, mortgage you know, mortgage crisis because well, they, you know, you, 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 you're you talking about a depression not just a recession yeah no exactly so depression. so are, are they are they doing this and then you know saying oh it's to protect people against covid which i mean again you, 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 uh, it's a again, little, that's, a, that's a little late in the day for that now it's but not, it's like uh, they, the they, they, they're, they're doing that so that when the when they have finally fucked things up so beyond repair 
they could just go, oh, and, and anti-right law in effect, you guys are locked down, you have to stay home. There's, it, that's the whole gaslighting thing. They're basically yeah. telling you, uh, we're going we're gonna to subjugate you more, we're going to restrict you more, we're going to take your human rights away, but it's your fault we're doing it. Yeah. That's, that's the thing. But that is, that is a, a far-right, you know, fascist kind of ideology. You know, divide and conquer, and then it's like gaslight and tell people. So I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. Belinda will heard it before. I'll be quick. So, <laughs> no, we got, we got, we got, we got but, time. You, you go, you go. Yeah, right ahead. My, no, my we, okay, but then we move. Like, I'll tell you this, and then we move on from the but subject because it, it's, it's like, it's a, uh, it's a rabbit hole. You know, we yeah, can go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, so I can, I can talk from experience about this whole kind of uh, fascist kind of rising at the minute because my uncle's godfather. Back in the 30s, it, basically, my uncle's godfather was Oswald Mosley, right? Really? Yes. Wow. My uncle, bless him, he's not around anymore, but his name was Anthony Oswald Mosley Greaves. So uh, my granddad, in the 30s, he was a member of the Black Shirts, right? Mm. But when the Black Shirts were a socialist movement, so my granddad, he was staunch Labour, he was a left socialist. And the Black Shirts were a socialist movement, right? Then comes along Oswald Mosley in the 30s, and he said, okay, I'm the leader of the Black Shirts. I'm going to protect your communities. I'm going to do what's right for the working man, telling everybody what they wanted to hear. I'm going to protect your communities and your jobs. But then what he did, he said, well, you know what? It's that guy's fault over there. That The, the man with the brown face, the man who's different, it's their fault. right? Then it becomes national socialism. Hmm. National Socialism, obviously, is Nazism. Same yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. Oswald Mosley was Hitler's right-hand man. He became the leader of the British Nazi Party. That came from a left socialist movement. The same thing, exact same thing, happened all over again with the whole UKIP thing. People who were voting Labour, people who were socialists, good, hard-working people who didn't have enough of a, an experience in life or an education to realise they were being lied to. <laughs> Yeah. Nigel Farage comes along like Oswald Mosley, promises them the world, tells them he's going to look after them. Oh, it's all happy, blah, blah, blah. But it's their fault. It's the illegal immigrants. It's this guy. It's, you know, same fucking thing all over again. And then they influenced the whole vote. They influenced the Brexit vote. They influenced the, the general election. And it's happening all over again, you know. Can I just... So, sorry, yeah. and then that's it. Oh, that's, for you people in England... This this MP for the Animal Justice Party, Emma Hurst. Mm -hmm. Have you what were they saying? I, I was so happy to see that she's. I mean, I don't actually know a huge amount about oh. her, to be honest with you. Yeah, they got um, yeah. for the Animal Justice Party, and I saw her talking in that. What's that crazy room where everyone just goes oh, yeah, yeah, up and down? What's the common in Parliament, the House of the House of uh, Commons. Yeah. Just Yes, yeah, so they got an MP and she's all over the place. I'm like, thank mm. God. So you know who to vote for now. Well, I mean, this is the thing, you know. I mean, there is, there is. I mean, I mean, she's doing. I'm not. Shit. Yeah, I mean, the, that. But that's the thing, right? So my conscience, right? I've I've always believed in voting with your conscience, right? So I've always voted green because they're the closest to my own ideology. I don't agree with them on everything, but then I don't agree with, but I don't agree with the whole political system, you see. Mm. So I would be what somebody might call an anarchist, right? Because I believe in, I don't believe in this system. I don't believe in first past the post, you know, I don't believe in, the, I just start again. But you have to vote and I believe in. I never what, vote. You know. So my conscience, with it, but then my conscience, I probably agree with Emma Hurston that, you know, what you she's saying. Her. You should read the trouble is, with, without proportional representation, without the right system, you, you're wasting your vote. Mm. You know, you well, that's, your that's the thing. I, I you know, I, I've, I've often spoken to folks about, like, politics in the UK, and I said, I mean, it, it's it's such a dysfunctional system and it's so utterly corrupt. I said, it, it, it has gone on the same trajectory no matter who has been in power. Mm -hmm. um, and I said, 
there's going to be a changing of the guard in 2024, but it won't make a difference. The country no, will keep well, going in that same direction. Um, and it, and all that will happen is in five years' time, you know, conservatives will say, oh, Labour is to blame for all of this. Then they'll get into power. Nothing will change. The trajectory will stay exactly the same. So I'm with you when it comes to um, not believing in the system. I, you know, I don't really... I, I just I just don't believe that the government has your best interest at heart. And I don't understand how anybody in this day and age, with everything we've seen, especially over the last five years, how you can look at an institution like the government in any country and say, these people, they really care about me. They want they want me to live to live my best life. Um, and all of this crazy shit that's going on around me, that's just a function of, you know, COVID, blah, 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 bullshit bullshit and and actually you know again you touched on something interesting about taking away the rights i think one of the most insidious things that have been done in the over the course of the last um you know five years especially is taking away rights and then giving you back some of the rights and making you feel like they're doing you a favor that mm -hmm. to me was the thing yeah. that i struggled to wrap my head around most it's like you, you're making me feel like uh, like you're doing me a, a, a favor by letting me get on a plane or by letting me, you know, go to the shops with a fucking cloth hanky on my face. It's ridiculous. And it's the, the other thing that I find frightening is is and this comes back to the education system is just how people just swallowed it up wholesale. It's like the 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 lack of resistance that there was to to some of the uh, you know totally draconian, ridiculous baseless rules and laws that people brought in it's just it's mind-boggling it's like do people not have any principles and then you realize no they don't because they never get taught any principles at school so they never assess anything political through any kind of principles they never assess anything you know that they see externally in the news through any principles and go logically this doesn't make sense to me maybe i should look into this in a bit more detail they're not interested they're just there you there you go that's not, that's not, that's part of it body, not body, nothing body, makes sense to this no what the fuck, it's know? like so, I mean, it's funny actually. You, you, it, it reminds me, like, it's the, I think because we're a little bit obsessed, maybe with some kind of, you know, m medieval kind of feudal system and all that sometimes. But what you're saying, it, you know, we've we've spoken about it in the past. You know, it's like we touch on it with certain things with John and the Boy or with Crippled by Phoenix, you know. But we use our creativity to. You can't you know, shut up. About important. To, to no, I mean, you fight your oppression, but it was like. Say, for instance, the old there was an old CBP song called Le A Letter Concerning Dogheads. Mm. And that was about, like, the medieval church. And they were telling everybody, don't go in those woods. Don't go the other side of the woods because there, there's people there. There's these monsters with dog heads, and they're going to get you. Um, but if you come and you, you pay your tax to the church and you come and you worship, we're going to protect you, you know. And they will, they will say it with full conviction. People will believe it. And like you say, people will swallow it, hook, line, sinker. Same thing now, exact same thing now. You know, they'll tell you, those guys over there, these illegal immigrants, the guy with the brown face, he's a terrorist. They're going to come get you. We're going to protect you because we're strong on law and order and we're going to, mm. you know, it's, I mean, the whole thing's bullshit basically anyway. So, yeah. But, you know, I think like, you know, bring it back to the music slightly. It's, uh, the the original question: How did you how did you and Belinda meet? <laughs> and oh, then we're like all, all the all the way into like oh, oh king yeah, from oh, the yeah. government. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, but that's but, but that's but that's the thing you see. We we do. Uh, oops, where's she gone? Where's Bubbles gone? There she is. Um, the people. You see, we don't get accused of being overtly political too much, but we do get it a little bit. Mm. I would say that I would say neither Johnny the Boy or Cripple Black Phoenix are political. All we do is like speak our own truths. Mm. We live by our own rules. We live by our conscience. We speak for our conscience, and we speak for people or animals that can't speak for themselves. Or nature. It's, it's all good, you know. Some days we might not feel like talking about that. Some days we feel like talking about that. It's nothing political. Po politics, they influence everybody, especially nowadays because it's so oppressive. But, yeah. but music, I mean, Johnny the Boy especially, I mean, it has to be an escape as well. Thing, you know? I, I don't do lovey dove songs. I never have. I can't do that. <laughs> it, it has to be things mean something oh. you know, but i can't do love so you're tigger without you 
I've done three love songs and that's for animals, but that's about it. And it has to, you know, if you got a voice, I'm gonna, an opinion, I'm gonna, I'm gonna mm. say it. Well, you know, I was going to ask you actually. Without you, you mentioned it's a it's a you know it's a love song with you know specific you know animal in mind. What 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 is the song about? It's about Tigger, our three legged cat that no one cared, <laughs> about, and that came in and it was like when he came to us, he was like twenty, and he moved into us, and it was a cool, it was the most lovely thing. He was um he was left. It was a it was living on the street where we live. Oh. Where I live, um, and uh, yeah, he was abandoned. He was abandoned by his own. <laughs> That's beautiful. Yeah. And 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 how uh, how how long did he stay with you guys, or how how long was he with you until he passed away? He like died five. in his arms. By the way, I missed it. That's you know. So mm. for how long? How long did you say? Maybe like four, four years, five years, four years. He was almost. He pretty much like we. Yeah, but like I said, you know, his owners—they just—they moved away from the village and just left him. Yeah, they just left him. Well, so, so we we he, we live out in the in the countryside, um, and uh, we've now so on our I, I we the, we we basically live on like a horse livery yard, so. Um, my uh, fiance's parents live in a house, and we've got got like a smaller annex that we live in. Uh, but there's lots of room for animals, so so my, my uh, fiance that works at a vet. Uh, we now currently have eleven cats on our property. No! Because the, so we we inherited one who they they found her in a in in, in the forest uh, when she was about probably five six weeks old. Brought her to the the vet. And it was obvious from what we could tell, she had an infection in her paw. And, I, and we think what happened is whatever scumbags had owned her previously just kind of tossed her aside, like we can't be asked to pay for this, the treatment. So off she goes. So we brought her in. And so she's she's here now. Uh, her name is Pearl. And then we got an, uh, we, we inherited another one because we were outside one night and one of one of the other cats was having a tussle with, 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 with a cat. And we thought, is that one of ours? And we was like, no, it's not. Totally different. Then the then the folks that live up the road contacted us and said, "Listen, our dog has just gone after a cat. We think that uh, you know she got hurt and you know she might be dead, but you know just wanted to let you know." So Paige went around, uh, you know, set cat traps out in a couple of spots, you know, around kind of a you know probably one two mile radius of the of the house. Finally, got the cat, checked the microchip, contacted the the owners. Uh, and the owners were like, "Oh no, we we don't know, uh, we don't know what happened to her. We don't want her back." Mother now she she was fifteen miles away from the owner's home, so it's obvious right. that cats don't travel fifteen miles away. No, it's obvious that they just that they just abandoned her. But it yeah. also turned out that she was pregnant, so, so uh, she had five cat, cat, kittens of her own. Uh, actually, six kittens yeah. of her own. Um, so ergo, eleven cats now in total. But. Um, I can, yeah, I, can, no. I can relate to this story. <laughs> when I met Justin. He had seven cats, two chinchillas, and a rabbit, all rescued. That's when I yeah. was like, "Oh, yep." <laughs> I had a house house full of animals. Yeah, I, 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 but I've still it's still kind of like that, you know. I've still got we six. Got, we had two Bengals that were uh, there was this Bengal cat mama who who gave birth when I was living in England at the time at Justin's. So. Got the two Bengals and five cats at your parents because you he lives you live in an annex too kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah, unfortunately, yeah. The, the the no the no joke. I'll tell you <laughs> now. <laughs> the rabbits on on our property unfortunately get cut short shrift by these cats though because they're a bunch of murderers. <laughs> it's, there's a lot of rabbits, so you know that's you know it's as hard as it is. You know you have to understand the natural order of things. So like yeah. I've I've always had like no problem with the cats catching animals. Of course, if they say, for instance, they bring a mice mouse in and it's alive, I'll I'll rescue it and I'll take it somewhere that the cats can't mm. get it and give it a second chance and all that. But what can you do? Cats cats be cats, you know. That's their yeah. nature, you know. They don't they don't have a choice, you know. They don't have the well, same. Well, in, in in my experience, level. cats that that eat naturally, like we had a we had a cat when I was growing up who was also a throwaway that we we inherited. But she she would, you could you could set your watch to it. Like Tuesdays and Thursdays is hunting day, and she would always kill either a mouse or she'd kill a bird or something like that, and she'd eat the thing. But she lived until she was about twenty two years old, um, 
and and the other one, uh, the, the 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 matriarch of the yard uh, is a cat who's now fourteen years old named Cooch. She's probably the worst murderer of them all. She's tiny, but she's. I mean, if you if you see a photo of all of them together, she looks the youngest of all of them, uh, exactly. and she is absolutely spot on healthy. She has to take a little bit of thyronorm because her thyroid, as she's gotten older, has yeah. started to become a little um, underactive. But outside of that, I mean, she's super healthy. My, if they eat natural, they just tend to live a little bit longer. So I agree with you. It it, it it's shit to see because they can be fucking sadists as well. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But um, the the it, it is better for them to at least have some degree of natural feeding. I, in their I mean, diet. It, it's it's a killer because, like, I mean, I'm a vegan and I have to, but I have to buy like raw fresh meat for the cats because Bengals it's actually healthier for them to eat some. Yeah, but cats or, or need meat. That's so they, uh, can't be vegan. <laughs> then cat, yeah, they haven't got they haven't got the choice, you know. They, that's that. You have to you have to do what you've got to do. But it, it it really that's the worst thing. That's kind of the worst thing about them having to like actually get stuff like that. But anyway, it's the you do what you do, you know. Yeah. You gotta live by your own conscience. <laughs> So, uh, what are the what are the plans now for this band? Because you guys are getting, I mean, I, it, it feels to me like there's m like there's more buzz building around this band now. I mean, certainly, like as soon as I, I've I've featured the band, play the music on the on the on the podcast, like there's a lot of people commenting, like this is really really good. Oh. I have multiple people saying like this is a top ten contender for the year for them without a shadow of a doubt. <laughs> so, it it feels like there's there's a, a groundswell of interest around what you guys have done here. Is it is it going to stay a project would you take this out and play live you know yeah, what, what's the what's the plans no, with it this ain't no side project <laughs> just, just need to say it ain't no side project yeah well, and we do want to play of course we want if someone wants to, to have us you know we have but we haven't got a book we haven't been looking we haven't you know we're the new band on the block a debut band we've got no booking agent we got no man we got nothing but we're not yeah we, we're not really but, uh we haven't got anything. We got the label, but that's you know. But we mm. haven't. We do want to play. Yes. Oh my god. Yeah. I, th I think it's because it's like we kind of we, we kind of half planned it only. You know, it was like all of a sudden we sort of got swept up with this thing where it's like, yeah, we were talking about doing it for ages, and then all of a sudden we did it, and then all of a sudden there's an album. All of a sudden we're talking about playing live. All of a sudden there's people actually following us. Yeah. And absolutely. it's like, and and we're like, holy shit! You know, we did like. You know, we've been doing Crimson Black Felix for so long, and that's all set up and everything and established. And all of a sudden, we're this new band. Um, yeah, no management, no booking agent, no, no, nothing because we've not even thought about it. You know, and we don't want to. We don't want to write coattails of CBP. You know, mm -hmm. and the thing is, we're not in the same country, so we, you know, we kind of do need like a you know booking agent behind us because we how are we going to get like two in England and then. Uh, we got, you know, like if Brody's playing bass, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and he said he wanted to play bass in the band if we play live. And But how's that going to happen if we don't, you know? <laughs> and you guys need to be able to rehearse and stuff like that as well. And and also, obviously, playing live is, is an expensive proposition nowadays. Exactly. Yeah. But, I mean, but the good thing is, though, compared to CBP, this band is going to be. Will be yeah. yeah. Yeah, we're going. To, it's going to be easier. The logistics and the expense is going to be a lot better than CBP is. Like, we don't get to do very much because it's such a complicated and expensive thing to put together to go on on tour. Although, previous years, you know, it is actually if if things work well, it's actually just as easy as any band. You know, you just get one together. But as soon as everything gets expensive, CBP gets really difficult because mm. we're so. Much to do festivals next year i mean a, a few festivals you'd think you know but like i said we don't you know we're not we're we're bloody 50 years old we, we don't have that act, activity how do you say activity -ness to go and like chase and ask oh, no. yeah 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 we're, yeah we're too, too too old and lazy yeah so if anyone's interested they'll have to come yeah, i was about to say if any bookers are listening that they wants to get you guys playing <laughs> Do it, but I mean that th that would actually be quite cool, right? If it's if it's something where almost you you guys kind of keep it for special occasions, you know, play like a We're set gonna, at, uh, a, at a specific festival or you know at a specific. That, yeah. I'd like to go. I'd like you know. I'd, I'd like to go on tour. I mean, I'd like to go and play. You know, play these songs live and everything. You know, I mean, 
Right. We're just we're gonna we're just about to record uh, record a certain song by a certain ex band of ours. Mine. Well, yeah, we have, we're, we're going to cover a certain song from a certain band. Justin was in about a certain band you were talking about earlier. Ah, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just just hints. But um. Yeah. But but you know the thing the thing what like see I've left that band alone. I'm not one of mm. these guys that tried to reform it. Right. That's fucking bullshit. That thing is. That's not. I. That's not. Oops. I nearly said the name. That's not what it was. Right. When we split up, we made a pact never to reform, and that was it. And that was with a guy who's not no longer with us. Mm. Right? You don't go back to that. So yeah, yeah. As I, I, I like to treat that band with the, as much respect as possible and leave it alone. So we're not going to go down that route. But when we was doing Johnny the Boy, and I was listening to Belinda, and for the first time since. The 90s since i was in that band for the first time i heard somebody putting vocals down that were as spiteful and as vicious as those other vocals mm. um and and it was and it was brilliant it just and i was just like you know what you know fuck that modern reformation thing <laughs> you know we'll do we'll do a song Let's just get it out there. Let's just do it and get it over and done with. And it'll be, you know, Belinda's just gonna blow them away. Not 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 us, not me, Belinda, I think. I'm just well, she's gonna knock it out of the park. So oh, I can see that without a doubt. Definitely. Um because so she, one... has the, she has the same natural venom. Yes. Yeah. Well that's the thing, like again, I I, I, I can't remember who I spoke to about this, but I, I said about like modern death metal vocals or modern extreme metal vocals where it's black metal death metal there's a i mean I, i'm a big fan of a lot of new stuff that's coming out i'm not a believer in the idea that you know it's you know everything you know, the best music was made in 1990 not not by any stretch of the imagination but what i will say maybe sometimes is lacking a little bit is that organic sound in the voice like if you go back mm -hmm. and you listen to the first deicide album for example glenn, glenn benton sounded like he wanted to kill people on that on, on that album mm -hmm. and <laughs> it's the most violent hateful evil sounding shit that you've ever heard in your entire life and and there's actually you don't hear that they, because because of the way people record and the way that you know there's there's so much more information now around you know, vocal techniques and stuff like that. I mean, maybe it's a case of people aren't willing to fuck their vocal cords up to quite that effect, that quite that extent anymore. But there yeah, is but, some of that, some of that maybe, rawness of the of the old stuff, the old vocal recordings that that is kind of missing. And again, I, I can feel a lot of that on this on this record, which I think is partly why I responded to it so well. I mean, may, maybe sometimes you have to fuck your vocal cords up. Maybe that's like you know you, the pure energy, and that's what it's about. It's yeah. about the energy. It's, about, it's not about how you want to sound and and what what's fashionable and everything it else doesn't so. do anything to my voice and it never has thank god you know we did play live with Stan and and it doesn't fuck them up it's weird mm. oh <laughs> i'll tell you what when uh we they were talking about doing this podcast i was like this i've listened to um listen to your podcast and you were playing some songs i have i you know what because i listen to stuff when i'm walking the cats right so i was mm. listening to your dulcet tones talking about playing songs and and deciding whether they're good or not and you had me laughing out loud walking around the garden with the cats right oh, really? because, and i can't and i can't remember what songs it were but i tend to agree with you on 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 your taste um mostly <laughs> but there was a couple of songs and it it genuinely sounded like it was going to be good and then there was this like extremes kind of vocal, and then you're like, yeah, this is cool. And then he then he just came up with this really, really naff pop kind of melodic singing. Oh, I know exactly what you're talking about there. Shade, shade empire. It's like it starts oh, off really yeah. heavy, and then all of a sudden it's like this. We're straight into like Eurovision territory. Oh, oh my god, fucking terrible! You know and it just went into this like you know, let's let's just get a commercial kick in there, and like you know, yeah. anyway, and. And the funniest thing was that you just like turned it off and just went, no, that's shit. <laughs> you just fucking turned it off. <laughs> yeah. 
No, well, I do with the um, with the, with the, with the news rant segment. I I I I do sometimes kind of think afterwards, like because the whole idea is that I I will purposely not listen to any of the songs until I record that. So when I when I start the recording is the first time I'm hearing the song, so I'm just kind of I'm you know I'm just bullshitting for an hour and 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 telling people what I think of what I hear, and, and sometimes people you know you'll see someone in a band making a comment, and we'll talk a bit about that, but. Um, yeah, I, I, sometimes when you get done with it, you like go, well, I've now written off this guy being able to ever be on the podcast. <laughs> this guy can never come yeah. on the show. So uh, it's like... you know, uh, that's, that's reminded me as well that on the same one, I think you were talking about Uada. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, my God. I I looked after those guys. I toured with those guys. I had to wipe their fucking... I had to wipe that guy's fucking ass every night. I had to look oh, after really? Oh, my God. <laughs> Well, like I said, that with that whole thing, I kind of feel like they 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 did their Justin, bro a little dirty you, there. You know what? He he's a fucking gaslighter. Seriously, oh, really? yeah. Because Jake, I mean, James. I, Jake, Jake. Um, I'm not going to talk shit about anyone. Yeah, by the way. yeah. I'm not. I, I'm, re I'm really not. I'm really not. All I can say though, I, no, because Dustin, who's the first one to to get Jake's treatment. Mm -hmm. He's still a good friend of mine. I'll, mm. I, I'm still in contact with him. Oh, so he's an asshole, is it? Then you can say what you. It's want. just not very cool what he does to people, you know. Okay. And I, I like I like Dustin and I like um, Josiah, who now lives um, in um, Gothenburg, I think. Yeah, he's really cool. He's the nicest guy. He's got like rescue cats, you know. He's they're just good people, you know. That mm. they're good people down to their soul. I think James. I don't really know him. He is the one that I didn't speak to very uh, as much, but I got a good vibe from him, you know. Mm. And Dustin vouches for him and everything. And then you just get this really unnecessary public outing of something that may or may not be true, and it's just a shame. It's just a real. Oh, it's 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 the public outing, and it's it's implicate. Oh, it's it's kind of dragging his wife into it as well. It's like, look, yeah, she's going through that... a tough enough time as it is. If these if these allegations yeah, it wasn't are true, cool. it that's wasn't... not that's not the right thing to do. What have I missed? <laughs> Um, soap it opera was, shit <laughs> yeah it was, it was drama so but the funny thing is though we had a, somebody in cbp that got outed mm -hmm. but rightfully so because he he was doing oh really, okay I he see. was doing really dark shit right and it got to the point where a, a poor girl in the, in the states had been groomed okay. so much to a point where when she found out and she was let down she tried to commit suicide Holy what? shit. She? Yeah, she's the one that went public with it. Did she why did she try to commit suicide? I mean I read it. Because of because of all the shit she went through with, with it all. That's uh -huh. why it all that's why it all came out in the first place. I haven't read mm. all of it. I just know about the dick pics and all that. Yeah. So the the but this was serious stuff. This was like actual kind of virgin on sexual predatory, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, yeah, a a guy who fucks up and has like you know has a fling or something and it's obviously yeah that's that's bad and everything but that's his private life and that's for him to sort out and, and when somebody in a band just goes on and online it's the worst place it just mm. he's essentially destroyed a guy who's yeah he might have fucked up but he's not a bad dude right mm -hmm. and he's definitely no predator you know yeah definitely definitely no predator and that kind of that kind of stuff. And I was listening to what what I mean because I knew I saw this. I saw when when Dustin, the old bass player, I see I see his posts because I'm friends with him on social media. And I saw it all happening before I was listening to the podcast. And then I heard you talking about the podcast and everything. And I was like, this is, you know, that there's so many things like this happening nowadays. And that band especially, and they and they did they. He gaslit something else, and it was about some kind of anti anti far kind of thing at some mm. gig or whatever. And it really doesn't look good on him, you know what I mean? He's like, you know, go, you know, just just stop, you know. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's a it's a real shame. Anyway, I'm not like I said, I'm verging on talking shit about someone. I'm not. If that's no, I think I think those are very fair fair observations. But uh, so, I would like to just say for the record. Josiah, Dustin, and James, they're all fucking cool guys. Mm. And I've spent a lot of time with them. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, <laughs> well, I'm glad. I'm glad I could make you laugh with a with a news rant. That's for sure. Oh no, that was no that that I love that because you know that's that's your natural reaction. It's the same. It's like Belinda's even worse than me. I mean, we're so like we are like a music fascist sometimes. Mm. You know, Belinda fucking makes me laugh, but I, I pretend not to. You know, if we're on tour or whatever and playing something, and obviously some days you know somebody starts playing DJ, Belinda's just like nah, off. Get this other one, you know, just, okay. yeah. It's uh, but it's all good, you know. It's, it's all good in um, if you take it with the right kind of humor, it's all good. Yeah, no, without a doubt. So I'm going to wrap up with one last question, uh, and and I, it's it's normally never a question I would ask, but I I feel like I, I feel compelled to do so. How did you guys end up settling on the name Johnny the Boy? Because like I said to you at the start of the conversation. <laughs> It seemed like such a strange choice that I went back and I watched that that scene on Mad Max, and I was like, "There's something about this that now makes perfect sense." It it, it, it it's absolutely brilliant. But like even when you hear the, like it, it took me like a, a, a split second when I heard the record the first time to actually place the sample, and because yeah. the first time you hear it, it sounds like it's it's like an old. You know when they when they like show highlights from old racing footage, like Formula One in the 1950s uh, or something. Yeah. It sounded it, like something like something like that. And then I'm like, no shit, this is from this is from Mad Max. Yeah. Um, but yeah, how did you guys end up settling on the name? Can I just start, Justin, and then you can continue? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Oh, we well, war was just a name to have until we found some. First, everything was taken. I mean, I could sit and look in a poetry book, whatever. Oh, this, oh, taken, taken, taken. Yeah. Taken. Anyway, we wanted a name that kind of threw people off. Not that like, big, we sound like we do. Oh, we should have some kind of metally blah blah name we wanted we wanted a name that you can't you can't fucking tell what kind of music it is mm. well you thought it was some kind of what did you think emo emo yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah we wanted a name that does not does not give away what kind of music it is and mm. then justin go on please well yeah i mean yeah exactly what you said i mean the, 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 I'm the, a, yeah i mean a lot a lot of my favorite bands and my favorite albums they're bands and albums that I had no clue about, and I was like, "What? What the fuck is this? What a stupid band name or something." And some of those, well, mostly some of those, become my favorite bands because it's like you're discovering something. It's a surprise, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like it it doesn't do the obvious. Uh, it's and it's more exciting that way, I think. So yeah, I mean, there was, there was we definitely wanted something that is just like, you know what, like just something. You know, cool, right. tweeted, doesn't, doesn't matter. And not even checking us out because of the band. Right. And yeah. then, like, I can't even remember how it came about. I remember writing Johnny the Boy down, and we when we talk about it, and Belinda was just like, oh, yeah. And it's like, really? Okay, right? And the more we talked about it, the more we liked it. And it was just like, do you know what? That character in, in, in Mad Max is the most unhinged character you know mm. he's he's totally untrustworthy you don't know what he's gonna do and it you know that kind of um happy accident you know yeah, See, yeah, yeah, yeah. like a, an idea born from a desire to do something a bit different and then all of a sudden it kind of makes complete sense to us you know it's for me because i'm australian you see i'm born in australia yeah. Mad Max was the first movie in driving, you know, when you were like tiny six, seven, and the car felt like it was that big. It was popcorn, everything with my Yugoslav uncle, and it was, and it was Mad Max. And what's that one with the other one? I told you about it. What's that movie called? Oh no, it was video. Was it video drone? Christopher Walken, you know, when he goes yeah, the ice and it, then he's psychic. It was video, those it, oh, that's the oh, Dead Zone. Oh, dead Zone. God, that's one. Dead yeah. Mad Max and Dead Zone. Well, I remember. <laughs> Oh, it was amazing. So I, ha I have a connection because I'm an Aussie too. So and, and Johnny the boy is fucking crazy, and, and we are crazier than we look. So <laughs> well, I may I, be innocent, but no. <laughs> I, I did say that was the last question, but I got one more, just purely because <laughs> I know people are going to be interested in. Are, are there any plans afoot to do a sequel to Banefire or to do a uh, an, uh, a new Crumbleback Phoenix record? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> C C CBP will will continue on. Um, it's it, I don't. It's a juggernaut that will never stop. Yeah. Um, Studio, tell me, Justin. I've just recorded a bunch of new songs. Oh wow. Um, yeah. Um, 
So, because Bane Fire, the, that was written over two years ago. It was recorded about two years ago. Yeah, over two years ago now. So it's a new album to most people, but we had to sit on it for so long. So to us, we're kind of, I mean, for me, um, the, my writing kind of cycles or whatever, I'm well overdue. I, I'm, I'm really wanting to, to move on with, with Cripple Black Phoenix. But uh, uh, next year marks 20 years of, of wow. myself doing, doing Cripple Black Phoenix. I started when I, I was still in Electric, <coughs> Electric Wizard when, uh, when I started there. Uh, doing Cripple Black Phoenix. Hmm. Um, so yeah, 2004, is, and so next year is 20 years. So, I recorded some new songs. I recorded some new cover versions. So we're gonna do the second kind of horrific horrifics kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and we, possible, well, I have started re-recording re some old Cripple Black Phoenix songs in the style that we play them live now. So yeah. big, heavier kind of versions of old songs. Um, and a sneaky Johnny the Boy thing. <laughs> awesome. So, and then so, and then that, that would see the light of day next year, I assume, to, to tie into the uh, anniversary. That's that's the plan. That's the yeah. plan. I think I think Michael at Season of Mist, he, uh, he's like really, I mean, he's such a cool label boss, yeah. I have to say. We have, we have to, I have to big him up because, uh, there's not many people like him in this industry, seriously. Mm. Um, and that's not just because he's our label boss. We've actually become, you know, we have a good relationship with him, which is really rare. So, um, and we wouldn't get away. Like, we, I can't think of any other label where you could get away with doing what we do with Cripple Like Phoenix and doing things so differently and then sneak in a song by our other band on an album. And then our label boss says, why don't you make a whole album of that? Mm -hmm. And then we make an album of that. I mean, wh what other labels do that? I just don't. So, yeah. So, Michael's very cool. Um, and he's really into the idea of maybe doing, like, a box set or, like, you know, with all this bonus stuff. We've got He's got some live material that we gave him and, um, yeah, and this new stuff. So, CBP will always just chunk along nicely. I think after the, there's a CBP tour coming up later in the year something quite special i can't say anything just yet but it'll be announced quite soon with some very good friends of ours i think after that i think i'd really like to do a johnny the boy tour or at least some shows mm -hmm. and i think i i already want to do the next johnny the boy album you know i'm so i'm so it's so nice it's so nice to have people say nice things about it because we have no idea mm -hmm. you know? we just we just did it we just did it and it was like straight off the cuff it was like almost improvised you know it's almost on the spot it was just like let's go let's do it and it was the most natural process the most natural honest songs 100 percent us no thought really just let's go you know so johnny the boy probably represents me and belinda more than cbp does even but wow. i shouldn't say that because cbp is my life and soul <laughs> But it's it's, it's a, I, I think that spontaneity that you that you capture you know especially as I hear you kind of talking about how the album was constructed it, that that spontaneity really really comes out and and again some of the best music ever has, has been just you know spontaneous creativity it's just it's just capturing that moment and that vibe and and this album does it so well so listen folks thank you very very much for your time that has been a absolute pleasure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh yeah hopefully we uh we bump into each other again at some point down the road yeah 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 absolutely yeah it's really really nice chat actually this is the best best kind of chat yeah. we don't 100 percent we All don't right. like we don't like the list of uh, questions <laughs> you, you, you're never gonna get that yeah mate so no. No. Well, and, keep, and keep up the good work with your, your news round because i'm gonna oh. keep listening to, i'm gonna keep listening to that and if if you don't switch off the shit song straight away i'm gonna be I'm gonna come no, back. That, that that'll 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 never go away. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Okay, thank All you. Right. Take Bye. care. Bye bye. Bye.
That was Endlessly Senseless, a track off of one of, in my opinion, the strongest contenders for the top 10, maybe even the top 5 of 2023 to be released thus far. The band is Johnny the Boy. The album is You, which is the debut that they've put out on Season of Mist Records, and I'll post a link to their Bandcamp in the description to the podcast, so make sure that you check it out. I've said it many times. Do not sleep on this record. Uh, I'll also post a link to the fundraiser for Justin Greaves' trip to the uh, Gravity Biking World Championships. If you have some uh, extra ducats to spare, throw it his way. And a big thanks to both him and uh, Belinda for coming on the podcast. What a pleasure talking to those two. Uh, and I will look to get them back on again, maybe nearer the release of a new Crippled Black Phoenix album. So uh, look out for that. Uh, also, if you don't know Crippled Black Phoenix's music, I'll play a track by them at the end of the show. Uh, right now, it's time to do a roundup of some of my favorite releases of the past weekend, and I'm going to start with a band called Confusion and their retrospective compilation, Storm the Walls, 1990 to 1994. <laughs> Now, Confusion, for those of you that uh, aren't aware, feature a long-haired Sheriff Mike Scandado. He's, of course, the co-host of uh, Necromaniacs, one of the uh, fully-blooded-in horsemen of the podcasting apocalypse, and he will be on an upcoming episode of Into the Necrosphere, where we will be doing a 666 countdown special of some of our favorite death metal of uh, the 1990s. Uh, Confusion, of course, um, was influenced by death metal, uh, are credited often for for creating deathcore as a subgenre of hardcore, uh, and what you will get on the Storm of the Walls compilation uh, is their 1990 For the Force demo, their 1991 Distorted Vision demo, their 1992 Taste of Hate EP, and of course Storm the Walls. Uh, it is raw, it's absolutely relentless and uncompromising, and if you like it, uh, the good news is that uh, the band are going to uh, tune up their instruments and play a couple of shows towards the end of the year, so do make sure that uh, you keep an eye out um, I think most of those shows will most likely take place in New York so you know the most appropriate spot for them really but uh, you know this record to me captures a vibe and it captures a moment in time that if you're a fan of hardcore was very special and uh, I think this this uh, compilation does an exceptionally good job of kind of bringing back that nostalgia next up we've got Kriegsgrav with Fires in the Fall So Fires in the Fall is available right now on Wise Blood Records. Uh, you will recall that I spoke with their um, founder, Justin Coleman, uh, just a couple of episodes ago. Um, this is the follow-up to 2021's The Sundering, and in my opinion, all-round improvement, both in riff writing, production, song structure, performances. Uh, this really is the band, um, I think, flexing their atmospheric blackened death metal and melodic riff writing muscles better than maybe they've ever done before it also has in my opinion one of the very best album covers uh, that i've seen this year so make sure that you check this out uh, it is absolutely fantastic it's more aggressive it's just more more focused than i think this band has ever been and i, I truly believe this is the record that has the potential to really elevate these guys to a uh, a much much higher station than they occupy currently next up out of norway we have the legend Legendary Tudor returning with Hellfigure, their first record since 2015's Antilive, uh, and an interesting change in direction for uh, the Norwegian duo. Um, this album, in contrast to their previous records, features lengthy acoustic flourishes, uh, operatic female vocals, as well as a uh, beautiful and perhaps even toned down cover of Nirvana's All Apologies. I am, of course, talking complete and utter shit because there is, from the very beginning of this record, no doubt that the, the boys in Suda are as pissed off and hateful as ever. Hell. 
Hellfager is Tudor at their most violent and brutal best. Uh, this is maybe heavier even than Desert Northern Hell, which, uh, you know, to me, it was, you know, uh, up to 20, 2004 and actually for a fair few years beyond, just one of the most uncompromisingly hateful albums that I had ever heard in my entire life. Uh, this album is uh, cut from similar cloth, as they say. Um, and, uh, you know, across its nine record or nine songs, I should say, it just does not slow down whatsoever. And if you like Tudor, you are going to be in your element listening to this. Uh, Nocturnal Breed is up next. Uh, they have put out their new record, Carry the Beast. I've had Swartov on the podcast talking about that album twice now. So make sure you check out both of those episodes. Um, and if you check out those episodes, I think it will enrich your enjoyment of this record because as both he and I, uh, um, discussed on his last appearance on the show. This is a very unashamed, um, nostalgic celebration. It's a celebration of what it was like for probably all of us at some point, uh, discovering old school thrash, discovering vintage black metal, uh, and discovering, uh, you know, several way several bands in sem seminal bands in the new wave of British heavy metal movement. Um, the great thing about this though, is that as much it is, as it is a celebration, it is also very entertaining and a great record in its own right. Um, thrash metal hates or the song I did a uh, react to last week on the news rant is a great example of what you can expect from the album, but there are a ton of great moments across the 12 tracks on this record. All performed very well, recorded in a um, an endearing lo-fi style, uh, and I think that Swartal's vocals, as I've mentioned before, just sound completely and utterly unhinged, and I, com I absolutely love it. Uh, I'm going to play one of my favorite songs off that record for you right now. This is Raise the Flag and the Hordes Will Follow.
Raise the flag and the hordes will follow by Nocturnal Breed of their brand new album Carry the Beast. It is available on Dark Essence Productions. And as always, I will post the link to the Nocturnal Breed Bandcamp in the description to the podcast. So go check it out. Let Swat Hulv and the gang know who sent you. I will also post the Bandcamps to all of the other bands I mentioned in my uh, release roundup. Uh, so go and show them your love and support. Right now, if your best mate's name is Peter Hotez, it's time for you to get to step in because this is my weekly news rant. As is usually the case, my friends, the saga, the odyssey begins on MetalStorm.net, my favorite metal news website. If you're not already checking it out, you should be checking it out. Uh, There is simply no other website that even comes close. And uh, the first headline, Tumulation Unleash Shattered Under the Eclipse Track. Uh, I don't believe I've ever heard these guys before in my entire life. It says here, Shattered Under the Eclipse, the newest preview tune from Tumulation's upcoming debut album, Haunted Funeral Creations, has surfaced online. The Californian Death Doomers will put the new outing uh, out on August the 4th via Hammerheart Records. Let's hear what it's about. <laughs> So I've listened to a minute and four seconds of this and already I feel like I've been through something of a journey here because that that, that noodling on the guitar that started us off, that very nearly made me switch it off and say this sucks and we, we move on. They then salvaged it when I heard that uh, distorted bass, you know, rumbling its way into the track. Um, you know, I, I thought, okay, just hang on 10 seconds. It, it sounds like it's getting better. Um, and when the song actually properly kicks off, not bad. What I've heard so far, though, of those vocals is is not inspiring. Um, I mean, I we're gonna we're gonna go back to it in just a second, but uh, I I feel like we're about to go through a uh, you know we we we've we've been to the peaks over the last twenty seconds. We're about to hit some valleys again. As I said, so far, very much undecided on this one. going to go ahead and say it i i think that that vocal track feels like it was from a leftover recording session you know back in 1991 um and i think the music itself it's not bad it's not unlistenable but the bar is just so high i mean for this kind of music alone you know you've got the likes of hooded menace um you know there's so many bands that we've listened to on this segment alone that are just more more memorable than what I've heard there. There's nothing memorable of what I've I've heard there so far. I think the best thing these guys have got going for them, uh, the album's name, Haunted Funeral Creations, sounds pretty cool. But other than that, it's not terrible. But it's I'm I'm indifferent towards it. 
and I don't, and, and actually that's probably the worst thing that you can be towards art. I think in general is feeling a degree of, um, of indifference. So anyway, uh, let's move on. We've got uh, Imperial Crystalline Entombment um, releasing their first album in 19 years, uh, emerging from their Arctic hibernation since 2004's infamous Apocalyptic End in White album. The inimitable Imperial Crystalline Entombment uh, returned to unleash Ancient Glacial Resurgence, a long-awaited second full-length onslaught of ravaging black metal. It was mixed and mastered at Night Sky Recording Studios. Uh, Mike uh, Rubishak designed the cover artwork. Uh, check all other info about the forthcoming album and the opening track uh, into a frigid bleak infinity down under. I can't say I've ever heard of these guys, so I'm not sure how infamous this possibly could have been. Um, but uh, they're certainly making us work for it because they've decided to put a Bandcamp player in there and obviously we know that's, uh, that's a no-go when, um, when it comes to what we do on Yeah, so I found it on YouTube. Um, I mean, they certainly talk a fucking huge game. They are signed to Deborah Morty Productions, so that, that counts in their favor. And, you know, those guys generally you know, sign decent labels. But uh, yeah, let's hear what it sounds like. We are still fucking up! Let me just stop for just two seconds there. Did the guy just say, we are still fucking ice? <laughs> I mean, you know, I, 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 I I'm... I said something the other day to somebody in a business context, and I said, I take serious people seriously. This is not something... That, I don't take it seriously when you say we are still fucking ice at the beginning of a song, but like I said, in that you know split second we've heard so far, it, it's not sounding bad. Okay, that's actually not bad. Although I would, I would probably take that weird guitar tremolo picking nonsense they've got going on in the the lower registers of the track. At least as, as, as at least as far as I'm hearing it, I would, I would, I would switch that track off completely. As a matter of fact, if there was one guitarist, the person responsible for writing it, I would, I would not let them write music for the band anymore because it sounds shit. But the actual song itself isn't bad. Um, you know, a lot of energy, the, the drummer, if, uh, if indeed he is human, um, or she is human, uh, knows their, knows their way around a drum kit. Um, so yeah, there's, there's some, there's something to this. Uh, and there's certainly enough to make me want to listen to the whole album when it comes out. Seven out of ten. Seven and a half out of ten, actually. I'm, I'm in a good mood. Um, 
but uh, yeah, in, enough enough as I said to make me actually want to go back and and yeah, you know, more of the record. All right, next up we've got Sworn, who have uh, got a new album out. It says here, A Journey Told Through Fire, a brand new album from melodic black metal representatives. Sworn has been officially released on all digital services uh, with a CD to be made available this fall, and it is now available for streaming in its entirety. Uh, a Journey Told Through Fire, I like the name of that album as well. Um, the band Sworn, not really a band I'm usually familiar with, but uh, we're about to become familiar with them right quick. This is dragging on a little bit now, but I must say, I really like it. I like the atmosphere that that opening is set, even though the voice sounds a little bit like it was taken straight from Diablo 4, but <laughs> it's uh, Elden Ring. But um, yeah, I, I, I do like it. I, I just had a quick scan of them on uh, Metal Archives while this was playing. Uh, they are from Norway, it says, and uh, currently unsigned. But uh, yeah, I think that uh, that opening, pretty, pretty good. Let's go to the second track, A Grand Eclipse, and hear what that sounds like. It's all right. Uh, I, I think I was expecting a little bit more after that intro. Um, as I said, that intro did a great job of setting a you know dark ambient tone. Uh, this just feels like I've heard it a million times before. And uh, you know, again, you could probably level an awful lot at some of the bands that I've completely flipped out over on the uh, on the segment. Uh, but uh, this is um, you know like on Seinfeld where there's good naked and bad naked. <laughs> This is bad naked. <laughs> no, it's actually, I mean, it's not bad, but it's just not, it's not something that I feel compelled to, uh, to keep listening to. Okay, uh, let us move on, folks. Uh, Metalite are streaming a new single. Uh, the Swedish power metal band Metalite are dropping their new track, Disciples of the Stars. The latter will be the group's fourth studio record, of which details will be disclosed in weeks to come. I generally despise power metal. Uh, I was mostly just intrigued by the, the name Metal Light, which sounds fucking terrible. Um, <laughs> but now that, I've, now that I've already spoken about uh, the band, we may as well have a quick listen of the song.
this sounds like music listened to by grown men who play Magic the Gathering when they're not watching pornography. That's that's about as kind as I could possibly be to that song. Uh, Cannibal Corpse, I mentioned this at the start of the podcast, they have released a new single. I'm actually quite surprised by how quickly they've turned this around. They, they've, over the last couple of years, been taking their time. And obviously, it's because, you know, they are busy touring, there's a big demand to see them live. Um, but uh, yeah, a two-year turnaround um, since their last record. It says, yeah, death metal veterans Cannibal Corpse will release a new album titled Chaos Horrific via Metal Blade Records on September the 22nd, 2023. Other details, as well as the album's first single, Blood Blind, can be checked out below. Additionally, to promote this new music effort, Cannibal Corpse have also announced a North American co-headline tour with Norwegian black metal legends Mayhem. I am, of course, wearing a Mayhem t-shirt. I'm representing, uh, and that is a fucking huge tour. So North American friends uh, get ready to be excited. Um, you know, as much as I've not necessarily been as drawn to recent Cannibal Corpse fair as I was to say something like The Wretched Spawn uh, and Evisceration Plague, I am always excited when they put out something new because I'm keen just to hear what they've come up with. So uh, let's uh, let's give this one a whirl. So there's a couple of things I immediately like about this. One, I think the production sounds fucking great. I mean, it is heavy as all get out. Um, I think that part that we've just listened to now, the subjugate, subjugate, subjugate the mind, you guys know I like effects like that. When used sparingly and appropriately on, on vocals, that's very cool. Uh, but uh, it's that riff. And I'm telling you now, I think that adding Eric Rutan to the band was the best thing that they ever did. He has breathed new life into them. Their previous record was also a big step up from the at least the last two to three they'd put out up to that point. Um, and uh, this just proves it once again. I mean, Eric Rutan has got death metal pulsing through every fucking vein. Every, every ounce of DNA in his body has been married up to death metal as a, as a concept. Um, and you can hear it. I mean, you know, that, that is, that is a, that is an Eric Rutan riff. There's no, no doubt about it. I don't even need to see the credits to know you wrote that. Uh, it says, yeah, drummer Paul Mazurkowitz says of the single, Blood Blind is about mass mutilations to reset the human race in a genocide that was embraced by the masses. Uh, adds guitarist Eric Rutan, Blood Blind was the first song musically that I wrote for Chaos Horrific. Yeah, there we go. I hadn't even read that bit, but you know, as I said, big shock. It all started with that funeral march riff of a, sorry, funeral march of a first riff floating around in my head, and it took off from there, heavy and disturbing. It worked its way into an aggressive smorgasbord of depth and swirling darkness. I thought it would be great to collaborate, so I had Paul add his lyrical stamp to it. Track list. Uh, this one is always, uh, you know, whenever it comes to Cannibal Corpse, the track list is also one I always need to check out because there's there's usually some pretty funny things there. But they've got Overlords of Violence, uh, Frenzied Feeding, Summoned for Sacrifice, <laughs> fucking genius, <laughs> uh, Blood Blind, Vengeful Invasion, Chaos Horrific, Fracture and Refracture, Pitchfork Impalement, uh, Pestilential Rictus, Drain You Empty. Uh, Summoned for Sacrifice, I think, is the winner as far as best uh, song title on the record is concerned. And then we have a uh, an album cover that, um, maybe I'm wrong here, but has a little bit of a bleeding throwback to it, um, but obviously with a uh, modern Cannibal Corpse edge. But, I mean, either way, it's not like these guys are ever going to do anything that's going to be 
particularly veering off of the very, very, very well trodden path that they have, well trodden path, I should say, that they've been on. Uh, and I think with Cannibal Corpse right now, you either like them or you don't. I mean, are they winning new fans by the truckloads? Maybe, but I, I wouldn't imagine that, uh, you know, people that are staunchly, you know, staunchly dislike their music are suddenly coming around saying, wow, this is so different to anything they've done before. And I, don't, I think, you know, they're fine with that too. I'm just looking at the lineup for that tour. So it's Cannibal Corpse and Mayhem, uh, and then they've got Gorguts, and they've got, um, is that uh, Blood Incantation? I think it's Blood Incantation who are playing with them as well. Uh, I don't know the uh, the the some some of these fucking bands logos look like the uh, marks that my cat makes on the uh, on the side of a wooden door with their nails. Uh, let's get back to it. <laughs> I think pretty much everyone is in, you know, fine form here. George sounds good. Um, Paul sounds like Paul, uh, you know, behind the drum stool. Um, you can't really hear the bass quite as clearly as maybe you've been able to on a couple of other Cannibal Corpse records. But I mean, you know, Alex Webster is, you know, the man when it comes to bass. So, uh, yeah, good stuff. We'll be looking forward to it. Will it be in my favorite albums of 2023 is another question altogether. Um... I'll have to hear the, the the end result, the finished product, to to make a decision on that. But um, you know, a lot of those bands, like the new Obituary record, good album, but it's it's not an album that I've you know necessarily kept going back to. Like I may do something like you know, this year um, Altari has been you know, mind blowingly good. Johnny the Boy has been excellent. Um, you know, there have been Ruim, of course, we've spoken about that. I mean, there have been albums that are, have set a bar that, I mean, I don't know how many other bands could uh, could even come close. So, but, you know, very reliable Cannibal Corpse is. Um, High on Fire are reissuing their debut album and then putting out the new one in 2024. It says, yeah, iconic stoner trio High on Fire celebrates its 25th year anniversary in 2023. I think we might have spoken about this last week, actually. Uh, anyway, they are going to be putting out the Art of Self-Defense, uh, their uh, debut album uh, on re-release. And then they have finished, I believe, their new album. They recorded that with longtime producer Kurt Ballou. Uh, and the album is the first to feature drummer Willis, who joined High on Fire in 2021. We definitely spoke about this last week. But it, it bears speaking about again, because High on Fire is fucking sensational. And if you don't agree with that, you are wrong. You are wrong to have that opinion. Uh, there's a Seven Dust song, which, uh, again, I'd sooner take a fucking chainsaw to the penis than, uh, than listen to that. We then got Hader Folk, who launched video for Drinking with the Gods. Uh, Omni Vortex, a tech death metal band. As soon as I see tech death metal, not interested. So next up, we've got Serpent of Old dropping a new track. It says here, Turkish black death metal collective Serpent of Old are presenting the sin before the great sin. Uh, another new track from their upcoming debut record, Ensemble Under the Dark Sun, out on June the 30th. Uh, I don't believe that I've ever heard a band out of Turkey. Uh, I can't. I certainly can't think of any off the top of my head. I do like Turkey as a country very much, food-wise in particular. Uh, and if you've not been there yet, I highly recommend that you go. Uh, there's a spot that I went to a couple of times called Fetier. They've got this really cool boardwalk that goes down the uh, the ocean. 
Uh, everybody is vying for your business. So if, if as you walk down the ocean, almost every single person is trying to seat you at their restaurant. But man, the food is fucking amazing and it is very reasonably priced. Uh, but anyway, uh, this band is on Transcending Obscurity Records, a label that I like very much. Uh, at the very least, they've been signing some really good stuff. So let's hear what this sounds like. <laughs> taking quite a while to get going now um it is eight minutes 40 seconds long so let's jump to four minutes 40 seconds and let's hear where we be at <laughs> I am digging that, guys. I'm, I, I'm liking that very much. Surprise, actually, they got picked up on Transcending Obscurity. This feels more like a Debo Morty style band. Um, but liking it and that little bit of the vocals that we caught, like that as well. I think that vocalist sounds like he, he knows his shit. Um, uh, certainly a uh, cut above the Eric Cartman vocals that we heard uh, <laughs> that was exposed on this segment last week. So, uh, yeah, I like it. Good stuff. Definitely a band that I'm going to check out. Uh, and I mean, we're a week away from that record coming out, so uh, maybe I'll talk about it a bit more next week. Uh, you are to announce uh, Crep School Natura North American track. A lot of you guys said they are a band that I should see live, um, you know, to properly get my head around, um, you know, around their music or at least to see their appeal. But uh, as I said, based on what I, based on the sig single that I heard, uh, there's no real appeal to be seen. Um, Hammerfall plan to record new album later this year. Lovely guys in Hammerfall, but uh, man, their music stinks. Uh, and like I've said before, I, I, I told I've told the story on the podcast before about hanging out with those dudes for an evening. Had a fantastic time. Felt so absolutely crestfallen at having to write a review of the album when it, I, it was actually i can't even remember what the album was but it was it was an album that was even worse than the others that they had uh, that they put out it's like man what do i do here um anyways uh baroness announced their sixth full-length effort um it says yeah baroness are set to release their sixth studio album stone on september the 15th through a braxton hymns uh, the band have chosen Last Word as the lead single from the record, accompanied by a music video directed by their own bassist, Nick Jost. The four-piece is also excited to announce Sweet Oblivion Tour across the North America this autumn to support and promote their upcoming new release. Baroness were a uh, Relapse Records band, if I'm not mistaken. A Brax and Hymns, I don't think I've ever heard of before. Uh, and I have no idea who else they've signed. So I don't know if they're a young upstart label and, you know, maybe these guys wanted to give them a... Give them a crack, you know, big, sorry, bigger fish or, uh, yeah, big fish in a small pond and all that. Sorry, I was struggling to find the uh, the, the phrase there. But uh, anyway, I, I 
I wouldn't call myself the biggest fan of Baroness, but I've certainly heard enough of this stuff that I've liked that it is worth hearing this. So let's uh, let's give it a spin. I like that opening riff very, very much. Um, the, the singing bit, I don't mind it, but uh, again, is it something I'm going to go back to and really want to listen to? I, I, I don't know yet. I'm gonna. This is going to be a song I'm going to need to give a listen to. I, I will correct myself, though. Abraxan Hymn, it shows how little I know about this band. Abraxan Hymns uh, are a record label that was started by Baroness, and I believe they've actually put out all of the Baroness albums. So I must have mis mistook... Um, Relapse Records as I mean maybe Relapse Records distributed them I don't know it doesn't really matter but anyway let's uh, let's get back to the song It's a very weird song this i think that the the main riff almost is almost wasted on the song based on what they've done with the verse um curious to hear what you guys think of this because it's one i i can't entirely make my mind up with but i've, I've like i said i think that that main riff could have been something super interesting you know impactful uh the the, the verse just feels to me like a bit of a waste um, I'm going to go to the halfway mark of the song because I'm, I'm keen to hear where the song ends up going. But uh, yeah, like I said, that, that's my verdict so far. Feels, feels like a missed opportunity. And it still feels like a missed opportunity, opportunity um, because they are still carrying on with that singing. So anyway. I'm not, not that I have anything against singing. I love me some singing, but uh, yeah, I don't know. There was just there's just something about that song that's not working. Um, you know, they, they're sort of setting a certain tone and then swerving off completely into something else and then bringing you back to the same thing. It it, it feels confused. Anyway, uh, <laughs> Alkaloid. I don't know who they are, but I'm gonna you're gonna know probably in a second why why I was drawn to this and why I want to hear it. After unveiling details of their upcoming album, Newman, uh, due out on uh, September the 15th, Alkaloid have premiered a music video for the first streaming single, Clusterfuck. <laughs> Check it out. Uh, like I said, no idea who they are. Newman, I don't believe they're referring to uh, Newman of uh, Seinfeld fame, uh, who, by the way, easily wins the award for one of the greatest side characters in the history of, of, of comedy shows of sitcoms. Uh, just, just wanted to make sure I got that in there. But it seems, by the way, that uh, Alkaloid are on uh, Season of Mist. So, um, again, another label with a rep for uh, signing decent bands of all shapes and sizes. So let's hear what Clusterfuck sounds like. <laughs> Why should we reach 
for the scar Why bother at all The odds are never good So You know what this reminds me of a little bit? Um, I don't know whether you guys remember the band Misery Loves Company. I know that they um, they reformed actually a while back, so I, mean, I don't know how active they are now. They had a record called Your Vision Was Never Mine to Share, and there's something about that song that, uh, that reminds me a little bit of uh, some of the songs on there. One thing that I don't understand is they call the song Clusterfuck, and then the start of the video, they've got the Alkaloid logo, and then Clusterfuck, but the U has got a star it's censored i mean what do they think people are going to do watch the music video and then go i clicked on a, a a song called clusterfuck which by the way you called by name clusterfuck in the title of the the youtube video but oh god don't show me it don't, don't show it to me in that in that font uncensored that's too much for me to deal with so that that's a bit whack but um anyways let's get back to it Look out Now it's getting almost grungy. It's like, I don't know. It's not bad, but it's, uh, it's not my vibe. I'm sure there'll be some people that like it, but uh, old Jackson's not one of them. Um, all right, let's see what else we got here. Norway's stoner punk crusaders, Bukasa, are pleased to announce the signing uh, with their homeland label, Indie Recordings. You would have thought that their fortunes would have been a little more... Um, uh, more prosperous after they toured with uh, the uh, the Metallica gang, but uh, it was not to be. They were fucking terrible on that Metallica show. I can tell you that right now that I saw them on. It was, I mean, excruciatingly bad. Terrible choice for a band to open for them as well, but Metallica are renowned for selecting shit bands to open for them, let's be honest. Uh, a band they will never select to open for them, of course, Oxbow, who have got a new single out. Oxbow are premiering Dead Ahead, a brand new preview song off their upcoming studio album Love's Holiday, which comes out on July the 21st on Ipecac Recordings. The accompanying video clip was directed by Chris Birdie. As I've said before, big fan of Eugene Robinson. Uh, big fan of Oxbow, really like that last single, so uh, I'm hoping for a uh, consistent form on this new one as well.
It's always a good thing when I have to remind myself to check the timer on, on a song because I'm so engrossed I can let it go for the whole thing. But uh, yeah, I, I like that. Um, very unique. Not not the heaviest, but I mean, you know, we can we can open our minds up to uh, some non-necro stuff from time to time. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think the cool thing about this is there is no band that sounds like Oxbow. Uh, Eugene's voice sounds fantastic. Um, instrumentally, they you know the guys know what they're doing. Um, you know these are these are work of pros, and uh, it, it's yeah, like I said, I like it. I enjoy it very very much. Uh, let's move on. Um, Queens of the Stone Age unveil animated video for Paper Machete song. That's almost certainly going to cost me the fucking hassle of having to edit that out when YouTube blocks the video worldwide. But once again, that new Queens of the Stone Age album is fucking brilliant. Uh, Exodus have inked a contract with Napalm Records. Californian thrash metal veterans Exodus and Austrian label Napalm Records have joined forces and signed a worldwide deal for the release of the band's next full-length effort, the follow-up to 2021's Persona Non Grata. Big surprise with that album, as you all know, if you followed the podcast. Also, here's another surprise. Uh, when I had um, Jack Gibson on the podcast, that's the, the that's the episode of the show that got the most heat as far as like um, thumbs down, dislikes, you know, whatever you call it is concerned. Um, not Nas Alchemeth, not Brock from Panzerfaust, Jack Gibson from Exodus. One of the most inoffensive conversations I've ever had. I mean, you know, yes, we we got into it a little bit on, um, you know, the the culture and the politics and stuff at the at the end. But I mean, I, not in not any way more than I've done with a host of other guests. And I don't think we were saying anything that was, you know, particularly incendiary. But w for whatever reason, um, someone felt compelled, or a couple of folks felt compelled, to say, "I don't like this man," and "I don't like this episode." Um, but uh, anyway, hopefully they continue to make music in the vein of Persona Non Grata, though, because I, I, I genuinely do like that. Uh, I like that record. Uh, Godthrum, second full-length album due in August. British epic doom metalers Godthrum, featuring members once involved in such luminaries as My Dying Bride, uh, Anathema, Valenfire, one of the best of the best bands ever, and Solstice return with their new album, Distortions, set for release on August the 18th via Profound Law Records. Distortions is the second part of Glenn Cross's Visions trilogy. The third part, Projections, is already in the works to taste a piece of the new music effort, give a spin to the song Echoes, uh, and annoyingly, we once again have to go to... Um, uh, what's his face? YouTube to find that song. So uh, give me 10 seconds while I get that taken care of, my friends. And uh, here we go. So far, not bad. I mean, and, and they, they don't, you know, half uh, play on the fact that they used to be My Dying Bride. I mean, you know, that sounds very... I mean, you, you, you're you almost waiting for Aaron to start singing. Um, I, I tell you what I like about this so far. <laughs> That's the album cover. Uh, it's this very kind of... I was about to say slick looking. It's not really slick. It's, it's quite a disturbing what looks like a clay mold 
of Gary Oldman um, from uh, the way he looked on that Winston Churchill movie. It's like two faces like morphing out as one. So you've got Gary Oldman from Churchill on one end or whatever it's called, like their darkest hour or I don't know what the movie's called. And then the um, the, the other head, that looks like um, old Nancy Pelosi when she uh, takes on her true form after, after dark. But uh, yeah, that uh, it, it's a pretty cool cover. Uh, that riff is pretty good. Um, it is another long one, so let's go to the halfway mark. But... Um, so far, so good. That's a uh, hard pass for me. That sounds like... Uh, now, That's that's gone from sounding like My Dying Bride to sounding like Cathedral, and I'm not the biggest fan of that band. Um, I mean, I wouldn't even say Cathedral just sounds like a load of wank. Testament are releasing their new album in 2024. I saw another article about uh, Nuclear Blast apparently having bought up the entire Testament back catalog. I'm very curious uh, to know how much they paid for that. No, it is, they're not saying anything, but um, I would assume we're talking probably... If I, if I had to spitball a price as they say on the street. It's probably, I'm going to say $2.1 million. If anybody knows how much they bought it for, let me know. But I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to take a guess right now and I'm going to say $2.1 million. Because you have to think about, uh, you know, like they, Nuclear Blast will be thinking about reissues. They'll be thinking about merchandise maybe. They'll be thinking about... Um, who can we license it out to? I'm, I'm, I don't see a lot of video games and movies lining up to, uh, you know, feature a song by Souls of Black. Um, but who knows? Uh, but yeah, like I said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sit with, um, uh, with 2.1 million. Right, we're going to do one more, and then we're going to head over to uh, the Democrats Guide to Rock Music. Celestial Sanctuary will put out a new album in the summer. It says here, Death Metalers, Celestial Sanctuary are ready to unleash their second full-length installment, the successor to 2021's Soul Diminished. Uh, the new one is entitled Insatiable Thirst for Torment. Fucking brilliant title. We've got a running theme of brilliant album titles this uh, this week. Uh, it's set for release on August the 25th, 2023 through Church Road Records. Uh, and uh, once again, my patience is severely tested with these motherfucking Bandcamp player em or embedded players they're putting on these articles. So let's hope for Celestial Sanctuary's sake that they've got a, uh, that they actually have this on uh, YouTube as well. And gosh darn it, wouldn't you know they do. Um, so we're going to listen to a track called Biomineralization. can fuck with that um i think the album cover is fantastic um i think the song could maybe get going a little sooner 
But I think maybe that's also just a function of the fact that I'm listening to, you know, these one minute clips and, you know, you kind of want something to happen so you can make a reasonably fair assessment of it. This being a first impressions style segment and all that shit. Uh, let's jump to two minutes 55 and let's hear where we're at. <laughs> So you kind of a corp should get to uh, play with them when uh, they inevitably come to the UK or when they come to Europe. The boys from Celestial Sanctuary. Uh, I think that's good. Um, I'd like to hear the rest of the record, um, but uh, yeah, like I said, I think it's uh, I think it's pretty damn decent. Okay, we move on to uh, to Blabbermouth. Um, there is news here saying that a photo of Slash and Axl Rose in the studio leads to speculation about New Guns and Roses music. I, I think that that hard school single they put out should should thoroughly dampen everybody's enthusiasm about New Guns and Roses music because as much as I would have been super excited about that myself, I'm a big Guns N' Roses fan, unashamedly so, but uh, that single is fucking terrible. It's worse than anything I heard of Chinese democracy and if that's the direction that they would take the new music into, then God help us. Um, Paul Rogers, I don't even know who the fuck that is. Tony, Tony Iommi explains why Black Sabbath turned down the offer, sorry, turned down offer to play this year's Power Trip Festival. I mean, isn't it because almost everyone in the band has retired? During an, an appearance on yesterday's episode of Sirius XM's Trunk Nation with Eddie Trunk, Tony, I, Tony Iommi, confirmed that Black Sabbath was originally approached to play the Power Trip Festival this fall, the three-day event which features a lineup of hard rock legends, Guns N' Roses, Iron Maiden, ACDC, Ozzy Osbourne, Metallica, and Tool will be held on October the 6th through the 8th at the Empire Polo Club in Indio, home of the Coachella Valley Music and Arts Festival. Uh, asked if it's true that there was talk of Sabbath doing the show, Iomi said, yes, there was, but I didn't at the point uh, it's hard because Ozzy's uh, been going through some stuff lately. He's in hospital. He's in hospital and out of hospital, and he's really been fighting it. And he really wants to get out of there. But in my mind, it's very difficult to sort of say yes. Uh, I've got to think of the people in the band as well. I've got to think of Ozzy, but Ozzy is playing there though. So anyway, <laughs> I've got to think of Ozzy uh, if he's going to be all right to do a show and whatever. So I wasn't that comfortable with it, but I didn't know Ozzy would be doing it on his own. Okay, there he acknowledges it. But it's great. I hope he can do it uh, and uh, that it'll be really good. He really wants to do it uh, and he's really trying to pull to get himself back. Uh, he's had to go through such a lot of hard stuff lately. It's such a shame, really, but he's still fighting there. I Iomi has had to go through some pretty hard stuff himself, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but anyway, um, since I shan't be attending the festival, uh, we may as well uh, discontinue talking about that. Um, Josh Homme says, Queens of the Stone Age's new album is tonally and emotionally and lyrically brutal. I wouldn't call it brutal, but I would call it excellent. Uh, Striper's Michael Sweet details health issues, asks fans for prayers. David Ellison says his new original music with Jeff Young may not be released under the Kings of Thrash name. Um, I hope the, the music world sat up and took notice of that one. John Bush on solo tour celebrating his era of Anthrax. It's something I would like to do before I die. Definitely one I'll be front row at because uh, I am, as you all know, a big fan of John Bush. Um, both as a man and, and as the front man of Anthrax, I should say. Uh, Cold Chamber is talking about making new music. It's very exciting. Certainly exciting for them, less so for us. Although I have to say as a guilty pleasure, that last Cold Chamber record, it wasn't bad. I don't give a shit what anyone says. I mean, I know, you know, my, my necro credentials have been blown to smithereens by that admission, but um, I don't give a fuck because, as I said, I, I thought it wasn't too bad. Uh, pro shot video of Biohazard's second concert at uh, New York City's Irving Plaza. Uh, the sheriff, Mike Scondado, was uh, at the show, I believe. And again, what a, what a, a 
fucking bill of just bangers from start to finish. You've got Urban Discipline, What Makes Us Tick, Down for Life, Tales from the Hard Side, Black and White and Red All Over, Genius, Five Blocks of the Subway, Excellent, Wrong Side of the Tracks, When That Song Plays, even when I'm old and incontinent one day, you can expect to see me in the pit for that song. It is absolutely fucking fantastic. Um, I know we listened to uh, some some footage of, uh, or checked out some footage of buyers at playing live uh, not too many episodes ago, but we're going to do it again because I want to. And not only that, but I'm going to try and jump to, I'm going to, I'm going to take a, a guess and think figure that maybe around the 25 minute mark we've got wrong side of the tracks father's day so sunday are you gonna let friday win to everybody that lives in the fucking boroughs that takes a fucking train to fucking work to fucking school this is five blocks to the subway fuck shit up uh Billy Graziade has uh definitely um he's uh packed on some muscle and you know he's not the youngest man so I don't know whether he's not the youngest man and if uh if I'm not mistaken and by the way if anyone's watching this they will be shaking their head going Jackie is an idiot because the timestamps were actually on that list of the, the of uh of tracks I just didn't uh I just didn't put two and two together immediately because I was too too concerned with giving you guys a, or, or you know making coherent commentary but yeah, I was gonna say, uh, like Billy is maybe mid fifties, and uh, he's looking he's looking beefy. Um, and as far as I know, he's he might be a vegan as well. So I don't know if he's uh, he's dabbling in some of that um, some of that testosterone replacement therapy, um, but uh, or some of that some of those Doyle supplements. Because again, let's be honest. I mean, I don't mind Doyle as a as a dude. Everything I've seen about him, you know, he seems like a nice enough guy. I know he's, uh, you know, he says he's vegan and things like that, um, but uh, there is no fucking way that he looks like that naturally. I'm one of the last people to point to somebody who looks shredded and say that dude's on steroids, but that motherfucker is on steroids. Not saying that Billy is on steroids, but uh, you know, like I said, he's certainly looking, looking some, looking like, looking like he's he's uh, he's gained probably at least fifteen to twenty pounds worth of muscle, which at his age is not easy to do. Now this, this bit coming now, when it comes to live performance, there are very, very few things. Like I can count maybe on one hand the moments at that I've been at shows that I've in, that are, that have given me a greater thrill than seeing this, being in the pit with this, and just hearing it. You know, like Biohazard is not the most musically complex band you know it's it, it it's it's brutish thuggish music at the end of the day I and mean, there's nothing pretty about it uh they do what they do and they do it extremely well but if you if you don't like them then in order to to appreciate why others might like them you have to see them live and you have to see them do wrong side of the tracks and you particularly have to be there for this particular section of the song because it is just it's magic it's fucking total thug magic <laughs> um so uh, let's uh, let's let's hear what it sounds like Best watch your 
I mean, if I am anywhere near you and that song is playing live, fucking run, <laughs> run. I, uh, it's just, it, when you see that, when you see that on stage, it is just so cool. It is so intense. It's so powerful. It is so simple. Um, but it's fucking brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Uh, and it's, it's, it's so cool for me to see those guys back together and, uh, you know, by the looks of it, you know, just as good as they've always been. Uh, all right, in flames frontman Anders Frieden rules out retirement. There's no reason to quit. Yes, there is. Your music sucks, and you haven't made a good album possibly forever. Uh, here's the article about Testament uh, having their catalog acquired by Nuclear Blast. I'm just going to scan through here very quickly to see if they say anything about uh, what sort of uh, what sort of scratch was uh, was profit for this. I mean, I know Chuck Billy has his management business. So I, I don't imagine that he's going to be a dumbass and just give away their music for nothing. Um, but it doesn't say there how much it was sold for. So uh, if anyone knows, let me know. Um, let's see if there's any other, th any other things of interest here. Uh, Slipknot to celebrate their 25th anniversary of... Uh, sorry, 25th anniversary of their debut album with special live shows in 2024. <laughs> Hard to believe they've been around for uh, for 25 years, I'll tell you that much. Um, Chris Holmes performs Wasp Classics in Wales. I mean, I remember when uh, my friend Alec had seen them live. Um, this must have been 2000, maybe 2001. He moved to Rotterdam uh, and he, he just messaged me and said he'd seen this new band, Slipknot Live. And, you know, they come out in boiler suits and he told me it was like off the chain intense so there was there was once a time when they were new and they were fresh and they were interesting but uh, unfortunately i never got to see them in the in the vintage days by the time that i saw them live they were um you know they they had done iowa they were massive uh and uh, i was just bored to fucking tears watching them and it did it, it i i disliked the show so much it turned me off to the band you know pretty much forever from uh, from that point forward um uh, right let's see d snyder on cancel culture you don't have to cave you don't have to apologize if you did nothing wrong d snyder spoke to fox news digital about refusing to fold to cancel culture after the twisted sister singer voiced his support for paul stanley's controversial comments criticizing gender affirming health care for children San Francisco Pride, which is scheduled to take place on June the 24th to 25th, was about to announce Twisted Sister's 1980s classic, We're Not Gonna Take It, as the official anthem of its 2023 celebration and Snyder had been set to perform. However, those plans quickly came to an end after Snyder shared his support for the KISS frontman's views that normalizing sex reassignment for children is a sad and dangerous fad. You don't have to cave, you don't have to apologize if you did nothing wrong, Snyder told Fox News Digital on Saturday. If you did something wrong, you know, if you did something wrong, you raped a woman, yeah, you got to do more than apologize, but at the same time, there's not something, sorry, that's not something you stand strong about. But if you have a position and a belief and people come at you for it, everybody is folding. 
Uh, Snyder also brought up the fact that drag icon RuPaul supposedly caved into pressure from some in the LGBTQ community earlier this year. D said the same thing, uh, sorry, the same time my thing was going, RuPaul was apologizing because he said he wouldn't have trans women on RuPaul's drag race. And he apologized and took it back because they freaked out. Uh, I thought, I mean, maybe I'm, I, I've never watched RuPaul's drag race, but I didn't realize that, uh, RuPaul's Drag Race didn't have trans women. Anyway, the singer said he was confused by RuPaul's decision to apologize. He said, uh, what's wrong with that statement? It's called the drag race. Dressing in drag is men dressing as women. Now we're accepting that you're a woman. So a woman dressing as a woman, that's not a trick. Oh, okay. I don't think he meant to say trans women. I think he meant to say women. Um, anyway, I mean, uh, this whole thing, I, I, I do agree with him on not apologizing. I think the worst thing you can do when uh, you are attacked by the mob is to apologize. And we've seen that time and time again. Um, you know, popular podcast host or popular celebrity says something, uh, it gets misconstrued, um, and all of a sudden everybody piles on and they're the worst person on the face of the earth. Uh, and then, you know, soon after, there is a groveling apology offered and, you know, I'm, I'm learning and I'm, you know, I'm listening, I'm learning, I'm getting better every day. <laughs> Um, I, I would say, uh, you know, in, in keeping with what Dee said, you know, if you're not wrong, then stick, stick by what you said, stick by your convictions. And, you know, especially if you have a track record of not being a racist, not being a homophobe, uh, you know, not being hateful towards people, and you have a bunch of zealots, which is what these people are, pile on you for, you know, something that I think is a very reasonable opinion to hold. And, and by the way, it's not just me that agrees with it. The medical community in many, many countries are also now agreeing with it, including here in the UK, where the National Health Service are stopping, uh, you know, at least the majority of gender reassignment treatment. Um, you know, so just because a, a couple of folks believe that, you um, or, or, you know, a, a, a couple of people hold such a deep-rooted ideological view so that, you know, the, so, so that it essentially feels and operates like religion. Um, if they come at you about something that they deem to be one of their mortal sins, by all means, you, you, you should push back and tell them to get lost. Uh, and I would also say, I mean, anybody who's, you know, in the orbit of that scene, you know, don't, don't estrange your, your allies. You know, I don't think that D could ever be called somebody who's, you know, in opposition to anybody from uh, the LGBTQ community, as much as I, you know, I'm not, not, not a fan of his. But uh, like I said, I mean, he's by no means an enemy, um, you know, so I think uh, I think he's right on this one, as much as I find it odd to say, because generally speaking, uh, I think D is, is he's more often wrong and a fucking blowhard than he is right. But uh, like I said, when he's right, he's right. Folks, on that note, we wrap up the news rant for this week. That wraps up another installment of Into the Necrosphere. Thank you so much to Belinda and to Justin for their time. Make sure you check out that new album by Johnny the Boy. Also, make sure you dig into the Crippled Black Phoenix back catalogue. I know it's not cult, grim, or necro, but it is absolutely fucking sensational, which is why I'm going to play out with one of my favorite songs by the band shortly. Before I get to that, though, a reminder. Next week, I will be back with Katie Irizarry of Susperia PR as my guest. We have a lot to talk about. Uh, and you will also get to uh, be thrilled by my usual news rant. We might even talk about some new music. Wherever it is that you are, whatever it is that you are doing, stay safe, stay healthy. And I will see all of you bad motherfuckers again next Tuesday. This is Crippled Black Phoenix with Cry of Love. <laughs>